Hey everyone, thanks for checking out another Hatchet Cast episode, and we have a very special episode today. We do have a very special guest, and his name is Roman, um, and he is an Air Force, retired Air Force survival instructor, or SEER instructor. So we're going to jump into uh, some really interesting topics and really pick his brain on all kinds of things related to survival. Uh, if you haven't already, make sure you guys subscribe to the podcast on Spotify or sub- also subscribe to the YouTube channel, Hatchet Cast Podcast. And also, if you get something out of this video, please share an episode with your friends and family members. It really does help out the channel. We're almost at 1,000. Almost there. So uh, obviously still growing it, but continue to help uh, share and spread the news about the podcast, and it really does help us out. So without further ado, Roman. Hey, so I got a real quick correction because somebody would kill me if I didn't. It is Seer Specialist now. Oh, Seer Specialist. Seer so the funny thing is that actually the reason that was such a big deal and the reason we got our, our goofy, floppy yeah. green hats is uh, we were going into combat all the time. You know, after 9-11, they started sending us in the war zone. And after a while, people are like, why are there instructors in a war zone? It doesn't make sense because people ah. hear Seer Instructor, and especially a lot of Air Force air crew members and stuff like that. They only saw us as a guys that taught survival not right. understanding that we had a lot of a lot of stuff to to give on the battlefield so we had to change our name to a seer specialist and then we got our little beret dumb hats i hate those hats man <laughs> they, they, they serve zero like seer is all about function like if it doesn't serve a purpose you don't have it yeah and then we get this floppy hat that does nothing it keeps my my left ear really warm that's yeah. about it yeah yeah well you are a lefty right yeah there you go <laughs> <laughs> uh well i mean uh Actually, we'll just start off. What does a SEER specialist do? Uh, so a SEER specialist stands for Survival, Evasion, Resist- Resistance, and Escape. Uh, that's the other thing, too, is a lot of people write SEER, though, like S-E-E-R or mm. S-E-A-R. Um, yeah, so Survival, Evasion, Resistance, and Escape. And so we specialize in training members how to survive in, in any environment, whether it's Arctic, desert, tropical, temperate, open ocean, or even urban-type environment, depending on the situation, um, how to evade in all of those situations as well, which ocean is probably the hardest one to evade in because you're just in the middle of the ocean. You can't do it. Yeah. Um, and then uh, resistance. So that's resistance to exploitation and interrogation. Um, and that can, you know, come across as a myriad of ways depending on who captures you. And then finally evade or uh, escape. Um, so that could be escaping out of restraints, escaping out of any situation you find yourself in. Mm. Um, so we, for the air force, we focus on air crew members and people that are high risk of capture, high risk of isolation, so special operations, things like that. Um, And then we started branching out a little bit more because after 9-11, everybody was high risk of isolation, high risk of capture because there was no forward edge of the battle area. And so anybody that went anywhere could have gotten captured, as we saw many, many times Mm. in Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I remember the Jessica Lynch thing that happened. And also, um, I think there was like a British national. There's a couple of like also like civilian local national or not local national but it civilian like nato contractors that were went missing and stuff like that there's so. a lot more than people realize wow it's co- constantly even i was in afghanistan in 2000 and there were still several people that we were tracking not even attached to the military they were over there teaching in the college and got rolled up and were still being held wow um, and so that's one of the things we also focus on is you know we always talk about you know no one left behind mm. is we are always 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 looking for people um no matter what until we find until we find you yeah. alive whatever it is like you know we still have people doing repatriation over in vietnam looking for remains um so that's one thing that america does really really well is, is watching after our people to make sure we we close those chapters as much however we have to mm. yeah i think there's you know the american military has a long history of trying to recover personnel or citizens that are you know overseas and either dead or alive and uh i actually I don't, did you guys listen to the last sean ryan podcast with the uh, afghan that he interviewed? I did not know. So Sean Ryan recently interviewed a member of the NRF, which is the National Resistance Front, that formed after the Taliban took over Afghanistan. So they're still fighting the Taliban. Um, but he came on and was able to get on the Sean Ryan show, and he and Sean was interviewing him about all the Americans that are still in Afghanistan that got left behind. Mm-hmm. It's and a good it's, thing we're still funding them. Yeah, it's a good thing. You know, four, four million a week. What was it? Dude, yeah. 40 million. I think it's... Plus all the gear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So all that stuff, I mean, that as a, you know, being a vet of that war, that just makes me... Makes you... Real happy. (laughs) Uh, But, yeah. 
Well, we're going to jump into the SEER stuff uh, here soon. I want to start diving into that survival stuff. Um, but one of the things I want to talk about recently was this morning, I was listening to the Redacted show, all right? And on the Redacted show, they had a Border Patrol agent who had been a Border Patrol agent for 26 years. And he now is an investigative journalist, and he uh, retired from the Border Patrol three years ago. And he went back to the same location that was his last duty station. And he said it is as far as like night and day. He's like, they don't, we don't own that territory. There's people on the American side sleeping in sleeping bags and tents and stuff like that. And they were looking at him like he was the trespasser. And he's like, we owned this place three years ago. We don't own it anymore. Mm. And he's like, I actually was in fear for my life because they were going to attack him for being filming them. And what's crazy is he brought up some statistics, and he's actually coming out with a documentary. And some of the statistics were absolutely mind-blowing. So one of the things that is a, a big deal about this open border that a lot of people don't understand or realize is because I don't think it gets enough coverage is that um, we have, within the past two years, how many illegal immigrants do you think have come through the border? Take a wild guess. Mm. I don't even know what the... Uh, what, uh, right, right. Source, I, where the, do you start? Yeah, so in the past three years, we're saying? Yep. In the past three years? Oh, man. I'm going to say... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to... 17 I'm, million. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess at an average of three million a year. I'll split. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'm going to do. Then I'll do twelve. Then I'll split the difference. Yeah. Twelve million. One dollar, Bob. Yeah. What is 12, this? Price is right. Rule. Twelve million. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 All right. So right now, Seth is the closest to that number. We are pushing near fifty million. Oh. Mm, I was off 50, by only a little. <laughs> fifty <laughs> million <laughs> illegal immigrants that have come into the country in the past three years. Wow, I wasn't that, that close. We, that is <laughs> that is thirteen percent of the American population. That is has crossed the border. So we got to think, and he was talking about how there are hospitals along the border, um, emergency services, food, uh, food, uh, what are those places? Food, not food like shelters, food banks, food banks yeah. uh, shelters. They're saying they are so task saturated. They are so many people that they cannot handle the volume of people that are coming in. The other crazy thing that he brought up is that what is happening is the NGOs or non-government organizations that are bringing these people into the country are being paid by the federal government. So they're being paid by the, the uh, Homeland Security. And these NGOs essentially are tasked like, hey, you know, we're, we're going to transport these people. We'll, we'll spread them out to different cities and stuff like that and kind of get them away from the border and just, and just kind of give them a new place. And so they literally will ask the government for a blank check. Hmm. Now understand, uh, these non-government organizations are using buses, are using planes, are using, um, you know, paying contract people like a family. Hey, I, will you pay, you know, for uh, five thousand bucks? Will you take this family or take this these five guys in your van and drive them over to this area and just dropping them off? And so, what will happen is, is these non-government organizations they'll drop people off in New York City or New York, but there's not enough room. So the same organization is like, okay, well, yeah, we'll take care of it. Pay for us to take them to another place. They'll take them from New York to Michigan mm. and can't go to there. So, all right, we'll pay us for Michigan to go to Ohio, go to Ohio and then rinse and repeat. And they're doing this with sometimes 10, 15, 50,000 people at a time wow. through buses and all modes of transportation. He said one NGO, he was actually interviewing a whistleblower from the Department of Homeland Security who actually had the guy who was, he was the one that cut the checks. He said one of the NGOs was given a check, one, mind you, $600 million per month. Per month. $600 million per month to be able to take people all over the country and illegally place them inside of our cities and towns. You know what else is crazy? There are over 2,000 NGOs that are working the border. Hmm. So now, do the math on that. Do, do you think that was like a regular size check, or was it one of those novelty? It, and so he said, he said it was literally <laughs> the NGOs don't even ask for permission. They just say, "Here's what's going to cost. Cut the check." Mm -hmm. And they're and the government is just so oversaturated with trying to figure out the border right now, and it, that they're just like, oh, "Sure, yeah, just do this. Do it. Just do it. Cut the check. Get it done." Are they trying? I'm, to I'm it sure. Out? I'm sure that's novelty. But even if people were getting half of that mm -hmm. or one percent. Are you, are you kidding me? Yeah. 
The other crazy thing is all the major cities have experienced an average of an upcrease, uptick in violent crime of 400% an uptick in violent crime. I'm sure it's totally un- unrelated. Oh, unrelated. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Could you imagine? It's kind of crazy, but could you imagine retiring from your field at the perfect time? To he could he could probably claim like I'm not saying since I retired things went to crap, but <laughs> I'm not saying I was a force to be reckoned with. Yeah, but evidence. Yeah, ever since I left, <laughs> and yeah, it's just it's just absolutely, and that's just that's just the government paying for NGOs to transport people. That's not including. The money used that services is given, taking, services, yep. giving money yep. to the every Seven illegal, cards, food, this, everything. food, everything. Mm. And so oh, they're being dropped off in these towns and they have nothing to do. So my question is, is if you like, let's just say you got a, a small town. Actually, Sam was talking to me about it. He says his his mom and dad, they live in a small town of 1500 people in this town. They've got a couple of diners, some houses, nothing crazy, a Walmart. So you dump you dump 10,000 illegal immigrants at their at their town one they can't sustain it but what are these illegal immigrants supposed to do there's no job there's no place for them to go and eventually there's not going to be enough food and they're going to say well i'm just going to go into your house i'm gonna take it yeah I was, and, and a lot of times in other countries i'm sure you've seen from traveling around the world a lot of times crime is just a way of life whether it's kidnapping or robbery or whatever it is that's just like hey honey i'm going to work you know oh, yeah. okay hope mm-hmm. you get an american you know yeah kidnap them holding for ransom that's just their way of that's just their job and it's no big deal because a lot of other countries just They'll pay it and then let them go, mm-hmm. kidnap somebody else the next day. Jeez. And so it's not a big deal for them to go and break the law because they're just like, oh, yeah, of course. Why, mm. why is that a big deal? You know? I just don't. I, that that to me was just such a wake up call this morning of I didn't understand like how far the ball has already gone down the hill. You know what I'm saying? Like, screw the billions of dollars that's going to Ukraine and Israel and Taiwan. Like, just the cost of that on our own border to include the repercussions of that happening is just mind boggling to me to the point where I'm like, I don't understand. Like I've said this before on other podcasts, I don't understand the reasoning. So for, for someone or for the the powers to be the ones that are in, in charge that are sitting up there to them, there is no cost to stay in power. Right. Yeah. Mm. There's no cost. It doesn't matter how much they'll just print it. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's not their money. They don't care. They don't care. So it's not their money. So there there's, 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 it does not matter. They're just going to, it, the more that they allow in, the better chance that they stay in power. Yeah. yeah. So complete open borders, allow everyone to come in, they stay I, in power. And this is a perfect example of any time one side is arguing, like we've been talking about the border for over six years now, mm. you know. Back before it was what it is now, this, this is the reason. People who see this coming, you know, mm. that there's – they see the consequences, mm. and here we are. We're living the consequences yeah. now. I mean, before when you brought it up, it's like, oh, you're you're just xenophobic, or yeah. you know, I mean, no, you still are. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, true. That's, it doesn't that's matter. It describe. doesn't matter what's going on. You're still xenophobic. Yeah. you're yeah. a horrible person. What are you doing? Yeah, you don't like crime. What's wrong with you? So one of the things that they were doing in Very Europe, true. I don't know if you heard about this, but they were in Germany. Actually, there was an incident that I read about where there were illegal immigrants that were doing... Now, A, if you're listening to this right now with your kids, I recommend that you don't you know, have this playing where your kids are at. So let me give you a quick break to not Air allow buffs. you to... Yeah, but this is very brutal. Mm. So in Germany, they're doing what the illegal immigrants are doing. Because a lot of them, um, you know, from their own countries and stuff like that, just dudes, it's just a bunch of men, right? Military okay, age males, mainly. right? And they are doing daytime rapes mm. in the middle of the of the of public and so what they'll do is they'll go like eight to nine of them at a time they find a woman you know german woman german local or whatever or whatever nation this is happening all over europe they will surround the woman while one of them rapes her in the middle of the group and the other dudes are there to to stop anybody that's trying to intervene in broad daylight in the middle of the city so my question is, is like now we have where we have all of these people that are coming in, mostly men, that are coming from a place where their way of life, honestly, was a lot harder than here in America. The way that they do business is a lot more different. Their culture is completely different. All of the things that we think are 
you know, oh yeah, that's just a, you, you should know how, to, you should know about that. You should, that's an assumption that you should already do that. No. What you think are logical morals. Exactly. They People don't follow have, yeah. your logic. They don't follow your morals. They don't follow anything that you do. It goes back to what Roman was saying a minute ago, where, where their way of life, it's normalized to, to, yeah. to do crime, yeah. to, do, rape, to do evil. Rape isn't a do... word. It's not a thing. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's a woman. It's a property. It, you know? Yeah. yeah. What, do you, what do you mean I can't do that? She's yeah. property. They don't understand that. Yeah. It's just, it's just absolutely mind blowing. And that's one of those things where I think that all of us need to start waking up. And then, you know, when it comes to our training, when it comes to our skill sets, when it comes to our family, when it comes to no longer is it okay to have, obviously not, it was never okay, but even now more so like teaching your family members and kids and wives situational awareness. Like Mm -hmm. you can't just sit around and look at your phone while you're in the parking lot. You can't just be in your own little zone. Like there are people that are looking for an opportunity and they'll take it, you know? We're on the, the, as far as stretch it interstates wise goes and, in, in and, in you know, from coast to coast on the I-4 stretch, it's, it's the most highly human traffic area in the entire country. Yeah. Yeah. Just on, just right here where we're at. Yeah. So, I mean, that kind of goes along into what some of the things that you talk about and that you teach is you talk about that escape and also some of that resistance that pertains to, you know... But- even, start, who even are, starting before that is situational awareness. Yeah, like that's like it, the 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 hardest thing though is you can't teach situational awareness. Mm-hmm. All you can do is bring it up, and then tell people how to hone it, and then mm. hope they do that on their own. Mm. Like when I was teaching the kids the other day at, yeah. uh, at Trail Life, as I, I brought that up, and I'm like, "Hey, you need to be aware. You need to. It's hard to tell a, a seven year old to keep their head on the swivel, but if you you know again, if you see something, say something. You yeah, know, it's just a, a phrase, but if you kind of get that ingrained in their head. Is if something doesn't seem right, go find an adult. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, and this the sad thing is, there's, there's a lot fewer of those in America nowadays. Is finding an adult that has a rational mind that actually do something and care enough to to make a difference. Mm. You know, it's funny, or not funny, but the sad part is, is most people's situational awareness doesn't occur until something bad happens, mm-hmm. and then they use that experience to make sure that they are more aware for their own survival. Um, and it's just, you know, now like being that person to not have to wait for that bad situation to happen to be able to practice situation awareness is just, you have to do it. Like, mm-hmm. you know, it's funny. You say, you mentioned kids. I, uh, I raised my son. We would play, I made it a game. So I told him every, every time we would go out, okay, we're in condition yellow. So you're always on the lookout. If, if we're in the car, he's always looking, you know, he's, he's my mm. eyes. I'm like, if you see anything weird, you call out orange mm. and that'll, that'll let me know to look out for it. Mm. If you see something dangerous, you call out red. Yeah. So, every, yeah. and I'm always looking in the mirror to see if he's paying attention That's or if he's like that. You know, so, yeah. um, try and make it a game and then go into the stores and just say, Hey, you know, watch people, you know, people yeah. watching. So, mm. and, and it's fun. Yeah. yeah to be honest. Well, that's people, people watching is so much fun, especially I've, in Walmart. I've always said, uh, <laughs> I've taught a ton of over the years being in the firearms industry and, and having a gun shop and everything. I've taught a ton of, you know, um, basic firearm safety type classes. Okay. Uh, as far as basic knowledge when it comes to firearm classes, and what Eric's taught some with me before in the past, before we shut the shop down. And that was one of my biggest things. I always said, like, like people watching, like at the end of the day, become a professional people watcher like if you if you're talking about an nfl draft go number one be yeah. be that person that is and at the end of it when, when you start people watching you'll you'll realize how predictable people are and how much we're like cattle our entire society has been built around we're nothing more than ants we're nothing more than cattle we're herded into stores we go certain directions in the store you walk into a Publix, i guarantee you everybody's hanging a right going through the bakery section even if they don't need to go through the bakery and they're circling around. It's it's very predictable. Uh, what I what I like to say too is people will show you a lot more than they will yes, tell you. Yes. Yep. Mm. Most definitely. Just I you know like you don't want to think badly of people, but I kind of always assume that the most of the stuff that people come coming out of people's mouths is a lie, and so you got to watch their actions, watch what they're doing, watch mm. where their eyes are going, watch what their hands are doing, and that that's necessarily going to be a threat, um, but just watch how they hold themselves is going to tell you a lot about them. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's. If you have anything to to maybe make yourself better at situational awareness, is what you guys are saying is people watching mm-hmm. and just watch what people do, kind of figure that out. And also just going into 
not necessarily being a threat, you're talking about situational awareness. Mm-hmm. A lot of times if you're teaching situational awareness and people are observant, like you were saying with your kid, if you're teaching them to be more observant, that makes them a harder target. Mm-hmm. So if they're constantly watching around, yeah. and I also tell my kid too, is like, all right, while you're looking around, also make sure you can see me. Mm-hmm. Like I'm a lot less concerned about what you're doing, who you're with, and where you're going, as long as you know where I am and that you can see me. Mm. If you can see me, then I can see you. If you can't see me, I can't see you. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so if if you can get kids and adults to practice that situational awareness, they're going to be more aware, and just by being more aware, they'll be less of a target. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's also uh, honestly we we've been seeing an increase in women firearm sales. Yep. Can you talk about that, Roy? I remember when COVID happened, there was just a massive. Yeah, when COVID started, it would it I would say the outside of the typical normal buyer that was just kind of coming in trying to buy everything up to you know to have it in that particular moment uh, just in case they couldn't get it again or something. Uh, after that, it it, it I would say uh, it kind of became more than fifty percent of my customer base was females coming in without, we're not talking about with husbands or with boyfriends or with anything, a, a female coming in maybe with a work colleague or something like that, or a good friend or a girlfriend or whatever. Uh, that's, that's what it became. And I, I would say more than 50% were walking in off the streets. And then also those women were also not only were they, and this one thing that, that, that I applaud women for when it comes to this is the first thing that they were asking was how to become educated. Mm-hmm. Where so many mm-hmm. um, men, we tend to hold our pride, you know, um, and, oh, I know how to do that. Or my granddaddy taught me how to shoot guns or whatever it may be in or, or relying on their, you know, prior jobs, things like that um, uh, for their knowledge base. But, uh, but yeah, I would say well more than 50% of women that were coming would, will walk through the door looking, looking for knowledge on how to, become proficient with firearms mm. and, and sticking with it um, and, uh, and 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 making intelligent purchases also at the same time. So, yeah. I was going to say it almost seemed like 90% because you couldn't yeah. even, you couldn't host enough women's classes. No, mm. no, honestly couldn't. Every woman's class, it, it, mm-hmm. it would fill up like, uh, and it was, and, and the thing about it is prior to that, we actually, I used to offer, at one time I was offering a completely free women's class like a advertisement, but mm. then just to, just to try to get women into doing this and, uh, and, and maybe get like one, two show up or something like that. Sometimes I would, it'd be like every Wednesday night I would host it or every Thursday night. I can't remember what the night it was. And, uh, it would be like from seven o'clock to nine o'clock that we'd, you know, do, you know, introductory, you know, to, to, to firearms and, you know, how to select a type firearm and what, you know, understanding the firearm safety rules and which direction to kind of go in. So you can purchase, uh, purchase intelligently in, in the path that you should take in that journey. And uh, they would, no one would show up sometimes. It'd be completely just, I'd just sit there waiting for somebody to show up and no one would be there. But then as soon as COVID hit, it just immediately that situation awareness or that fear set in. Mm. It's like, hey, I need to put, if there was one thing that COVID brought, is it brought more people to be aware of what's going on. So. Mm. Another thing that'll drive women to, not just women, people in general, to leaning more towards firearms and really wanting that training and wanting to to protect themselves is a honest self defense yes. course. So yeah. many self defense courses are like, oh, all you got to do is mm-hmm. step on their you know step on their toe and then elbow on them in the groin and then like if yeah. a full size man wants to take you, there's They're nothing you can physically do. Mm-hmm. All right, and the and the good thing is my like my wife is fully aware of this mm-hmm. and she will tell absolutely every every female and be like, oh no, I could take a man if I really wanted to. Like, mm, no, you can't. Like, yeah. if no, and I tell this to kids too, like. If a full grown adult wants to take you, there's nothing you can do against it. The best thing you can do is cause such a ruckus that other people will get involved or yeah. for a woman yep. equal that playing field. Mm-hmm. The only thing that's going to make that playing field even is a firearm. Yeah. yeah. Something yep. with lethal force. Yep. Yep. And go, not, and go not, take one jujitsu yep. class, get put to sleep exactly, and, just, yeah. and just be aware of that. Okay. While you're sleeping, anything could have happened. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. And not, and not a knife. Not pepper spray, like that stuff is. No, I don't. I disagree with knives. I hate using knives mm-hmm. because anybody that is not trained in knife fighting, they're just going to end up hurting themselves. Mm-hmm. Pepper spray, that's a good deterrent, but it's not going to stop anybody that's dead set on doing something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I like all three. Yeah, I, I like all three, and I, yeah. well, I will. I, don't, I, don't I will like agree. telling people to use knives, right? Because people that, that's, uh, yeah, like I, I would agree. I, I would I would knife. They're like, mm, yeah, yeah. I well, and I wouldn't, and I wouldn't even. That that was one of the things too. They were they were coming in, and they were like, well, maybe I should just get a knife. Let me get a pocket knife. Like, <laughs> no, like absolutely not, because the the skill set that it takes to learn 
a crime of passion as far as just utilizing a kitchen knife and stabbing somebody to death, that's totally different. Okay. But learning how to use a knife to fight with, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother subject for a whole nother day. Yep. Like, you know, um, I agree a hundred percent. I enjoy knives, but I've also yep. taken the time to invest in and, the time to learn how to use a knife. Wrap that into a self-defense too. Right. Like, mm -hmm. here's this, here's this training knife. Correct. Try to stab me. Yeah. See mm -hmm. what happens. See what happens. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It's not as easy as you might think. Yeah. I mean, honestly, stabbing people to death with a knife also is not a very oh. quick process unless you're hitting something even if you hit like a jugular it's still a few seconds you know 15 seconds maybe before they're completely down but like yeah, that's a lot of time hot right? bath and super traumatizing yeah and the one that dude honestly like seeing knife stuff like mm -hmm. one of the things that's hardest to watch is like you see someone getting stabbed and they know they're dying mm -hmm. and they there's nothing they can do about it and it's like five minutes go by and you're just like Man, it's just brutal. Like, and imagine if you're someone who is not able to, you know, just due to size or age or whatever, that can't hold off an attacker, and you want to try to bring a knife. Yeah. It's like you're going to get murdered with your own tool. Exactly, like, that's well, what I say. Even, I mean, even getting shot. Did you do you remember? Did you ever watch the video of um, it was a drive-by shooting in Puerto Rico? Oh, dude, yes. And they were by this bar or whatever. Yes. So those guys got all sprayed in the pelvis. Yeah. And most of them, I think only one dude was actually dead within the first yeah. barrage. But most of them were sitting there bleeding on the ground. I mean, it wasn't until they came up the second time. And then executed them. Yeah. 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 yeah, that was brutal. Yeah, I mean, firearms are obviously not the end-all, be-all when it comes to it. I mean, training is the... It's no. a true key, but they mm -hmm. can be an equalizer. But it can be an equalizer, and it's and it, and as far as you know, taking at least taking a couple of classes with you know with pistols, you can you can start to become somewhat proficient, mm -hmm. where you can gain some confidence, especially you know a uh, hyper aware, self aware you know uh, individual, whether it's female or male or child, um, that now has started to that has clicked. It's like that situational awareness has mm. turned on. So when you, like you said earlier, Roman, you can't teach it. It just, it be, something happens, you're either born with it or something happens in your life and that switch in your body's turned on and now your, your, your awareness comes about. You can only kind of somewhat direct it. You can point it like, here's the highway, head down this particular direction. Here's some key things to look for. But the, until that switch is turned on, um, until they have that hyper awareness that kind of, has been triggered, you know. And the cool thing is a self-licking ice cream cone because then you have that training. You're more aware. You're more confident, making you a, a, a harder target, so you are less likely to have to use it in the first place. Yeah. yeah, and eventually you graduate to a point where now you are also helping make other people a hard target just by being there, mm -hmm. right? So, like, I think that's one of those things where we're always talking about being the asset, and that's what that means. Like, it means being the person that other people can rely on because we live in a society where everyone's passing the buck. Ah, oh, he'll take care of it. She'll take care of it. She'll do that. She'll, why she'll pick up that I trash. I always feel safer with Roy. Yeah. Well, and that, and that goes into we're not just not just from a defensive standpoint, but uh, but being being bold in all of that. I mean, it, it starts with we we talk about it all the time. It starts with our faith, even being bold yeah. with our faith. Yeah. And it's something that you know um, Eric, Seth, and I, you know, as far as this company and Tyler that have put so much of a focus in, and is just being more bold in that direction because that's you know that's where it starts at. You know, yeah. um, that's that's becoming an asset and becoming a stronger asset asset and willing to help people. Yeah. Well, I mean, it goes it starts back in your faith. If you have where you're no longer being a closet Christian yeah. and you're now being bold to talk to things, uh, talk about things with people that actually matters to bring them, uh, you know, the good news and the gift that Jesus Christ gave to us. Well, then also <laughs> you're more willing to talk to them about other things, right. you know, like you. but your intentions are higher than these worldly intentions for self glory mm -hmm. or gain. You now legitimately love and care for other people. And that's where that drive comes in. When we talk about that warrior spirit, um, you know, there's tons of guys, even in the military that are tier one dudes that are soulless, that don't have any eternal salvation and they do things for themselves. And, you know, I've, you know, coming from that community where that is definitely a real thing where egos are big and, and everybody's honestly at the end of the day, it's team, 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 but they're looking out for number one, um, whether that's through glory or vanity, um, or whatever, you know, but you have those, those warriors in the military who are in the same career, you know, career fields or even citizens that have that supernatural drive from their, you know, moral guidelines that come from the Bible, they just have a deeper meaning and a deeper purpose than as, as to why they're doing things. And so, um, 
you know, I think that's where you have more genuine people or people who are grounded in their faith and also bold because they have the love to be able to share it. So, um, and also it's kind of like, kind of like the training where you became a harder target is people know not to mess with you. Whereas if you have that love in your heart and Mm. you're sharing that with people, that's going to come out as well. And people know that they can come to you Mm. and people be more willing to come to you and talk to you about their struggles and about their walk in faith. And you can start imparting on them. And then you again, steel sharpens steel. So you're going to be able to bounce off each other. It's just, amen. Yeah. I honestly think that ever since we started being more vocal about our faith and honestly, as a company, not being closet Christians, because I was a closet Christian for most of my life, we were, we had a lot more people in class that are more willing to even, even in classes, like, more willing to open up about, you know, training things. And so there is that, there is that connection there that, that Christ brings. But, um, what, what are some of the things that you think are applicable skill sets for people who are more vulnerable to attacks when it comes to like, say, for example, getting kidnapped or being abducted? Um, what are some things that are things that people can just off the street start thinking about? Honestly, the, the, the it's so weird to mainly harp on situation awareness, but mm-hmm. that's where it all starts. That's the foundation of it. Situation awareness, not just like what's going on around me, but what is the worst thing that could happen right now? And I don't know about you guys, but that's, I've kind of always been that way my entire life. It's just by like, what's the worst thing that could happen right now? And then I'm waiting for that thing to happen and watching out for that thing, making me more, more aware of everything around me. Mm. So I talk, I try to talk about the people walking by themselves. If you're walking in a hotel, you know, walking down the center of the of the hallway because if you're close to one of the rooms, there have been several instances where people have just opened the door, pull them in, that's it. Like there's nothing you can do now. Wow. All right. Um. You know, on the street. You know, if you're especially you know kids, women, anybody that's susceptible to being kidnapped, which is basically everybody. You know, if you're walking down the street, try to walk closer to the grass or closer to the building so a vehicle pulling up isn't going to be able to just snag you know snatch and run. Mm. Um. You know, if you're walking closer to houses, same thing. You know right in the middle of the sidewalk then and then always being aware and being ready to move one way or the other and it for people that don't do this normally it sounds exhausting yeah it sounds exhausting to be always on but it's just like working out or running or anything that you do if you do it often enough it just becomes commonplace and it's no longer exhausting yeah just a way of life. That's yeah. what I. That's what I tell my wife when I don't want to hold the baby. <laughs> it's like I'm, I'm pulling security. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, you know adding to that is 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 having that ability to, you know, we we tend to, I see it constantly all the time. Like when I'm you know walking around or I'm in a grocery store and I'm people watching, um, how people just kind of walk into each other. Mm. Like they just, you know, the buggies are colliding or they're just walking in. They don't have any depth to their vision. Mm. They have no distance to their vision. It's like uh, people driving. I'm going to be sexist for a moment. Women have (laughs) horrible, horrible (laughs) awareness when it comes to that. Yeah, Yeah, they don't they don't look far enough ahead. They don't look far enough out. They don't look far enough deep. They, They so next thing you know, it's it's immediately on top of you, like Mm. um, being opening up your eyes to to see things further in head um you know playing games you know as you're if you use it i mean one of the things i always uh, one of the things i've always liked to say as far as like when i'm filling up a gas tank or gill- filling up a pump i like to play four corners yeah. on my vehicle you know it keeps me moving or i like to teach that to you know teach that whether my wife actually does it or not i try to teach that to her <laughs> she tends to not listen to anything Maybe, roman i'll probably have you teach her yeah yeah, yeah that'll work, right, you, that'll yeah, work. Yeah. Never, yeah exactly i'll listen to somebody else yeah. so they'll be like oh i heard this great thing but hmm i yeah. wonder wh- who would have told you that yeah <laughs> yeah doing doing little things like that to, to open up your vision mm. to more so yeah yeah i definitely think that Honestly, in today's society, there's a lot of dudes that also probably have the oh, same yeah. thing. Well, I was going to say, yeah, <laughs> more, more soy boys and more men who just don't take responsibility. But mm-hmm. The good old cell phone, uh, scrolling the Snapchats and yeah. the IGs. And I the, think about that. Every time I'm in a parking lot and I see somebody in their cell phone, I'm dead. I just think victim. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Say it like that. Victim. Well, well, I think, <laughs> even driving down the road and then you see someone walking along the side, not on the sidewalk, mm-hmm. by the road, head in their phone, I'm just like, man, if I if I wasn't a good person, <laughs> if I wasn't trying to follow yeah. God's so, way. We were talking about motorcycles earlier. This is a good thing. If anybody that's a motorcycle rider, if if they don't do this, they're not going to be a motorcycle light rider. No, not, you have yeah. to look at everybody. And this is what we were saying before about people watching. Yeah. The more you watch people and vehicles and stuff like that, you kind of know what they're going to do. Yep. 
all right, this person coming down this way, that's a brand new BMW. They're definitely going to swerve in my lane without signaling or looking at anybody else mm -hmm. at high speed. Yeah. Right? So the, like, the more you watch people, the more you can be aware of what they're probably going to end up doing and then be able to counter that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, give Sometimes. Some. When, when I'm yeah. driving past that's people what... walking in the road, I'm like, oh, are they going to jump out? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, dude. I have to, every time I go to jujitsu, I have to pass by this middle school, and they're always just like, just pushing each other around like yeah. right next to the road. And I'm like, yeah, mm. I don't mm. want to hit a child. Yeah. But like I, nothing I can do. So I'm just like really creeping kind of almost yeah. hitting cars in the other lane, just trying to get away. Yeah. yeah. Jeepers. Next time you're driving in your vehicle, you guys have probably seen it before, but uh, if you, if you don't already do this, most of our listeners probably the same thing, but uh, uh, I want you, when you stop at a, a, a red light, I want you to look over if there's a car parked next to you. And I want you to see the immediate first thing. If they're not already oh, yeah. on their yep. cell phone, they're going to pick up their cell phone mm -hmm. because every moment that they have that they're connected away from it, that they're stuck, to, stuck away from it, their, their brain and their body has been trained to, to reach over and just grab it. It's so an addiction. It's, yeah. It's, it's an addiction. So... It's, 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 it's an addiction. It really mm -hmm. is. And now, you know, that is, it's almost like it's been a re it's, it's almost like it's almost been an intentional reprogramming in my opinion. I, I wouldn't say almost. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's because that, that's what the algorithms are for on the phones and through all these yeah. these companies. But, oh, man, they haven't looked at, at you know, Instagram or Snapchat mm -hmm. in, you know, 2.5 seconds. Hey, hit them up. Send them this yeah. notification. See if that if that does it. Mm. Yeah. It's like a dopamine hit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, and, and also our listeners, if you're driving, they're probably listening <laughs> to this podcast. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm watching it. Yeah, <laughs> I put it right in the middle of my windshield. Right. Uh, I duct tape my phone to the take, center of my windshield. Take a safety break and like, make sure nobody's scoping you out. Yeah, yeah, to exactly. You. Yeah. Seth's over there watching you from the curb. Yeah. <laughs> At night, you just seeing on, a you, victim. You put it on the yeah. dash backwards, so it's like a heads-up display on your windshield. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh. oh gosh, somebody's done that before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man well what are some obviously we have the situational awareness that people can work on as a preventative measure but um what are um some easy things to to think about like as far as if something did happen like if they're thrown into a car what's the first thing that they could possibly start familiarizing with themselves that's common and, or something like that so well being familiar with how different vehicles operate. Mm. So if, you know, like I, I, I do this with all, all my training courses, I'll, I'll put people in the trunks of cars and most modern cars that have trunks have those little glow in the dark tabs. You can just pull that tab and it'll pop open. Right. But if somebody's looking to kidnap you, the first thing you're going to do is like, Oh, well, I don't want them to see in that and cutting that thing off. That was mm. kind of loud. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but that wire is still there. And even yeah. if the wire is not there, like older vehicle, you know, if there's a, a cable, that pop, pops that trunk, that cable has to go to that actuator. So if you can pull apart that uh, insulation, you can activate that cable right there. Oh, okay. If you can't get that cable, it's just you know, it's just a little uh, a little tooth that's holding that trunk closed. So if you dig around enough, you're gonna find you're gonna find something that's gonna be able to pry that open, whether it's a tire iron or something like that. And if you can't, there's other ways. If you you peel apart the insulation, you can try to. This is where it gets a little bit crazier. You have to get a little a little nutty. Um, mm -hmm. Kick out the tail light from the inside. And then put your arm through the tail light, and then guarantee anybody seeing a hand waving outside of a tail light. Oh yeah, call the I, cops. I don't know. Nowadays, you would think that's people true. just think, "Oh, they're they're pranking." I you don't know. know. Did you? So there was a video. I'm a little off subject, but it kind of kind of on subject. There's a video of a cop that went to a woman's house because somebody called the cops on her because there was ha hair hanging out of her trunk. Do you see that one? No. Oh, it was wigs. It was a it was a wig. She's like, "Oh, that's my weave," and no. so she ran out. And he's like, he's like, you know, she, he 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 knocked the door. And be like, hey. I just want to let you know somebody's concerned because they think you have a body in your trunk, and then she would see saw it and freaked out. Well, thank like, goodness somebody called. Right, well, exactly. You know, yeah, yeah. But that's the way it seems to go. Yeah, they'll call when it turns out to be something like that. Mm -hmm. But then if it's something serious, yeah. it'll just be one of those like, oh, thought it was a prank, yeah. dude. But if you if you sorry, I'm, and I I get off subject. I'm no I'm no very keep like, going keep going. This yeah. is just a fluid so conversation. Like, Roman, you look like you could just punch your way out of a trunk. <laughs> yeah. Like nobody's <laughs> kidnapping you. <laughs> So the funny thing is, my wife and I were talking about this the other day. Like, I don't see myself as a big guy because all growing up, I was a small kid. I didn't put on weight until after I got through team and I started joining. I started in the military and, and started, and I never even lifted that much. I just did. I did hard work, mm. and so I, that's why I, my name, my aim was never to get big or strong. And I just kind of grew on me as I was doing my job. And so people, you know, I just I don't see it until I try. Like I was a I was a jujitsu and I tried on somebody else's gi and it was like 
fat guy in a little coat. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. not happening. Yeah. Um, but oh, so I was talking about the uh, the if you can't kick out or punch out the the tail light, you can grab the wires and start touching those together. Again, a flashing like arbitrary fra- flashing light mm. to get anybody else's attention. Um, you can try to. I'm getting way too in deep with the it, with the trunk. Going. Yeah, um, good going. These are great things well, to think about. I'm thinking about other different vehicles too. Yeah. Like I know we have limited time because you can always like um, inside the trunk. There's always a switch that you can pop, lay the seat down, mm. and then even even if you can't fight off your captor by making enough of a disruption, um, you can get people's attention. Yeah, you know, hopefully they're on their phone and they're actually paying attention. But enough of a disruption, and there's like there's so much stuff that goes into it. Like so, if you're actually in the vehicle. Ideally, what you'd want to do is you could try to secure the driver with their seatbelt. You know, you can grab it, wrap it around their neck. It'd be awesome. But at the same time, as you're doing that, you want to reach forward and try to slap the gear shifter into neutral. Mm. That's the cool thing about most automatic cars is if you just if you just shove it, it will shove straight into neutral and nowhere else. I heard like, if you put it into R, it goes really fast. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's cool. That, like, you you won't you can't accidentally slam it into reverse, which is uh, what people will be worried about. Is it you know come to a screeching halt? There's flipping or whatever. Mm-hmm. But if you're if you're trying to fight with this person, you slap it into neutral. No matter what they do, it's just going to come to a rolling stop as you're trying to wrestle with them. Mm. Was it in the movies? Like nine out of ten movies, when people do like that's how they escape the situation is wrecking the vehicle. Right. Yeah. That's like, <laughs> yeah. Yep. And luckily they walk away. Oh, of but. course, yeah, yeah. That's well, other than the movie would be pretty short. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's uh, that's definitely something that's. I think uh, you know most people don't really think about that until they hear it. Like even thinking about like punching out the tail light and sticking an arm out. It's like you don't. You just need to make something look abnormal. You yeah. know how often are we looking around? Well, hopefully, we're looking around while we're driving, and we're always looking at judging people's cars, looking mm-hmm. what they're doing. See, you know, look at that stupid bumper sticker, and now it's like. There's a hand sticking out the yeah, back of the world. truck. Yeah. 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 And after this, everybody go look on YouTube for car jujitsu. Oh, I yeah. love that. Dude. Yeah. Yeah. The That's competition. My yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I just it. found that by accident. And I was so excited. It's yeah. awesome. It was so cool. Everyone go sign up for car jujitsu today. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I would, I would do that in a heartbeat. Like that seems like a lot of fun. Um, but that goes with all any vehicle. That, and so that's, I do that all the time. Anytime I get in a new vehicle and the funny, like, again, it's weird. I guess I was kind of bred into this as I, I did that growing up too my dad was traveling a lot so every time he rented a car i would get in the car and go and check everything out well, how mm. does this open you know, can you open it from the inside can you how you know how does this work mm. um and, and then also understand and the cool thing about where we live now because this wasn't when i was a kid is you can go on youtube and find out how to do everything yeah yeah so if you you can find out how to bust out a window and if you can't and so as adults kids don't do this but as adults you can go to wrecking yards mm. and pay for, like hey can i buy that window <laughs> And smash it. Yeah. And be like, sure. And yeah. then you can get inside the car and be like, oh, seatbelt buckle. Can I smash this? And just like, just try different things in the car. Cause the last thing you wanna do is not practice this stuff. And then when you actually have to use it, it's the first time you're doing it. Mm. So you can go to wrecking yards or whatever and try all this stuff out. See what you have to see, how much pressure it takes and what you have to do in order to make these things happen. Mm. When you started that roadman, I thought you were gonna I thought you were gonna say, Oh, you know, growing up my dad would lock me in the trunk, so I had a lot <laughs> so, so funny story along those lines is um I, you know, again, being me, I've got a little bit of a messed up brain, um, but I was thinking of this stuff anyways. I've got a, a, a young daughter, she's seventeen now, but um I was shopping for a car when she was probably like five, six, seven ish. And uh, every time I'd go shopping, I'd I'd be looking at the car and I'd pop the trunk and I'd be like, Hey, hop in the trunk. And she, okay, like it should not be that easy. <laughs> so she, she hops in the trunk and I'm like, okay, hey, see this little tab right here? When I close it, the only thing you're going to, it's going to be pitch black. Mm-hmm. But the only thing you can see is this glowing tab. So when I close it, wait a couple seconds, pull that tab and, and push the trunk open. Okay. So she'd hop in there, do it. So we, I did that with so many cars. <laughs> I imagine that has got to look really weird to anybody driving past oh, yeah. that car a lot. <laughs> However, on the plus side for anybody who wants to use this, I never, ever, ever had a salesman come up and talk to me. <laughs> see, see, yeah. look at that. Not, not one That's call, practical. not one conversation. Yeah, great. A little bit of hair hanging out <laughs> yeah. of the trunk. Cops get called. Yep. Shoving a seven-year-old in the no, trunk. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. I'm sure that's just her dad. Yeah. <laughs> Dad, honestly, that's true. Like, that whole, that, like, oh, yeah, normalcy bias, you know? Yeah. Um, that's, that's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, that was over 10 years ago, so. Totally different, different times. Right. Yeah, yeah, different dude, time. isn't that crazy? <laughs> yeah, different time. Ten, yeah, 10 yeah. years. I mean, back in the day. Yeah, yeah back, back in the day. Back in day. Uh, we are living in the good old times right now because what's coming, man? Good yep. grief. Who knows? 
I just, that's crazy. You were talking about breaking window glass. We actually went to a Phil Vigor or Phil DeGroff class when it was a vehicle uh, shooting class. And uh, one of the things was he was talking about all the different uh, ways you can break windows. And one of them actually worked out really well is we found out that the glass breakers that are on like knives and stuff like that, they're like kind of like a, here's a knife. And I, we, we slapped this glass breaker on there. Mm. It, those are terrible. They don't work. And so what actually worked out the best was a Walmart seatbelt cutter. You can buy it at oh, the yeah. auto yep. section. And it has a little punch, and you just push a button, and it hits the glass, mm-hmm. and it breaks it automatically. And yeah. do you remember the— The Rescue know, Me tools are really good. Rescue Me was is that, good. Is the, that ba- little, the little ones like this? Yeah, it's just a, like a little clip, and then on the end, it has a punch. It goes on your that's, keychain. That's what we're talking about. Yeah, the Rescue Me one. They're yeah. specifically designed to go on your keys, so that way if you ever flipped over or were submerged, it's right there in the ignition, and it it— Genius. Off, so. Yeah. Did, did TikTok Even if, you buy that? No, th- this That's, was, I, I, I was buying those like 15 years ago. Yeah, so I'm just saying, my, bike, my b- wife bought one for every single vehicle. Yeah. yeah. And it just showed up. She's like, oh, look at this. I'm like, all right. But then the cool thing too is like it's got a, 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 a keychain and it's also got like a visor clip. So you, just nice. stick it right yeah. there. Yeah, that's it's the a, one. Again, that same thing is right there. Is she super proud of herself when she got them? Yeah. And she, you should have just told I, her, I, I all right, now get, honest, you should have said, now get in the trunk. <laughs> <laughs> I, make, I make fun of her for a lot of stuff she buys, but it's always good stuff. I'm like, ah, yes, that was awesome. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's, I, I usually that's put. The, that's the one we used in the class. Yeah, that's yeah. the one we used. Phil, Phil talked about it. I remember Phil talking about it, clipping it on your visor, things like that. Because mm-hmm. so, I always had the one on the pocket knife. Yeah, I was like, uh, but I never. Once again, I never went to a junkyard and tested it out. Or now I will tell you that I went to a junkyard when I was younger and threw a lot of spark plugs. Yep. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wish I wish my wife was <laughs> yeah. into that stuff. That um, was actually the spark I, I bought, plug was I the best. One. I bought one for my wife, and the other day I had to get something out of her purse, and 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 it took me thirty minutes to find what I was looking for. <laughs> yeah, I, yep. I, found, I also found everything else that I've ever bought her for potentially <laughs> to, to 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 help her out. She's yeah. gonna have twenty like, different choices, and it's gonna take her thirty minutes to find it. <laughs> to find it. Yeah. No, Which no, one did I no, That's the problem. It takes us thirty minutes to find it, but without even exactly. looking, while she's doing stuff, she can reach straight in. Organized chaos, man. <laughs> yeah, she can reach straight in, grab whatever she needs. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, the spark plug was actually the most fascinating one that we saw in the class. And essentially, you take an old spark plug, mm-hmm. you break it, and all that porcelain. that porcelain, porcelain, and he put it inside of a uh, M M&M and M bottle. You know the little M mm-hmm. and M's or a Tic Tac or whatever, and mm-hmm. he would just dump a bunch of it and chuck it, and it would just shatter, which is wild. But um, it's like magic. It's, it's so crazy. crazy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, go to a go to a junkyard and start and cutting seatbelts. Yeah, it's a lot easier just to get the, the whatever the thing the was tool. On, tool, yeah. tool on Amazon. But I do believe, like what you're saying though, you probably you, you can go to a junkyard and and uh, you know pay them you know their fees obviously because they resell that stuff. Exactly. So, so you're gonna have to fee, buy it. You're gonna have to buy it. But like, hey, I want to buy a couple seat belts out of whatever car you got and and go test out your seatbelt cutter. So. Mm. Some some dude who makes a living pulling parts at the junkyard is going to be so mad when he shows up one day and just all the vehicles have broken glass in the seats. <laughs> seat belts are cut. Uh, they do like, make a, don't happened? do it without paying for it. Yeah. Exactly. Like, don't do it without paying for it. Go pay for it. Like It's worth the experience. It's oh, not yeah. it, it, well, it, 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 the knowledge. People pay for those rage rooms, too. Yes, so it's like it, 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 it feels good, too. It's fun. Yeah. Um, but the, the, so the, I love the seatbelt cutter and the glass breaker. But then again, in my mentality, I'm always like, and I talk about this with optics too, which is why I like to have backup iron sights. Is like, I always think worst case scenario, mm-hmm. if I have nothing on me, mm-hmm. like I, I love that. I've got that in my truck. Cool. But if somebody chucks me in the back of a trunk or they, they go somewhere else or in somebody else's car, like I'm, I always want to make sure that I understand how I can do everything with whatever I might have around me right mm-hmm. now. Like yeah. when my mom, my mom used to call me MacGyver. Is I would just figure out what to do mm. with whatever I have. Why did I know, as a seer specialist, you would be a proponent for backup iron sights? That dude, Worst possible you. scenario. Because uh, I'm always be like, oh, well, the battery lasts forever. I was like, EMP. Yeah, I, yeah could be. I'm just, I'm just, I just think worst case scenario. Yeah, like if everything just absolutely shatters and I've got nothing else going for me. Look, if you have room on the gun, just add it. Yeah, just have it on there. Just add it on there. That way you can be judged Here's by me. Problem. Here's my problem with backup iron sights. Um, I don't have a problem with backup iron sights, but I have a problem with people that put backup iron sights on their gun because generally speaking, they never zero their backup iron sights. Yeah, yeah. or they, have a reason or, for why it's on there. So, or right. or they, they they or ever train with them or even know how to use them yeah. whatsoever. They just throw them on the gun because somebody told them to put backup hey, iron. How do you zero Glock iron sights? You don't. <laughs> actually, you can. Uh, you actually can theoretically. Uh, well, first drift, off, you're, you're drift shooting. The, first off, drift you're, the rear. You're shooting. 
shooting low left because <laughs> because you have a horrible grip. So uh, it's, it's <laughs> I wish I could shoot low left. That would be a blessing. So you're shooting low left, and if your shotgun looks like a or not your shotgun, your target looks like it's been hit by a shotgun, then then we gotta he just just come take a class. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, contender pistols. That was actually funny. Yeah. So we would I would always get uh, guys that would come into the shop. They would take it out there on the gun range. They come back in. And it's like my my gun shooting you know shooting left and it's shooting low and 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 there for a long time i would just you know i would i would walk through the paces of of explaining to them the process but then at some point in time i just finally gave up on that because just i was so wore out on it that i would just tell them like okay well i can't adjust your elevation but i can adjust your your, your left and right so let me let me shift the site so i'd take it back there on the bench i said it'd be like 15 bucks or whatever and i just shift the site over but like <laughs> take, take a little punch or a site pusher and shift it over to shift it over the opposite direction to get them hitting more back to center line and they're like oh you really can't do anything about the elevation i'm like no they're, they're pretty much like they're dialed in from the factory for that dialed like, in from the factory <laughs> so, man. So, uh you know uh but uh yeah that was that was man that one man I made a lot of money off of that. Yeah, yeah <laughs> the, the good old days. They're also days. the same guys that when they when they're trying to figure out what's going on with their pistol, they do this. Yeah. Oh, that's that's horrible. What? Oh, oh you, there's a special. There's that. a. Are you tell them about the video. All right. So, I have personally witnessed it, and I've also, I've also, personally witnessed it, and I have given aid to someone that has shot a hole in their hand. Okay. Um. So it's big deal is with lasers, but. For whatever reason, one of the things okay. that I see so common and so often is that people, you know, being in the industry for so long and selling guns, and I would, you know, clear a gun, hand a gun over to somebody over top of the counter, and the first thing they do is they, they, they'll hold their hand out for whatever reason, and then they'll point the muzzle at at, at their hand. So that's where I'm like, that's really what you're saying, yeah. like, make it make sense. Like, I don't understand the it, why. It makes, like, it what? makes, it makes zero, zero sense They don't even know why they they're doing it. They don't even know why they're doing it. It's like subconsciously that they're doing it, or if it has a laser on it and they want to see the laser, they'll point it at their hand so they can see the laser move around on their hand. Well, there's a video, there's several videos, uh, but there's one most recently, uh, and I do believe he's actually a firearms instructor. Yeah! Uh, <laughs> score. NRA certified. Uh, NRA. Do, yeah, I'm the only one professional enough yeah, to do this. So yeah. Yeah. I do believe he has an NRA certified instructor. Um, <laughs> but uh, so he's on the range. He's with his students, and he's, he's kind of showing them, and he, he, he basically just points the gun in his hand. He's doing this with it. I, it looks like in the video he's possibly trying to show them the laser. It, not, it looked to me like he was trying to function check it, like it was something going on that was wrong, and he was, like, doing that, and he was just looking at it, and he's yeah. like, and then you see him squeezing, and I'm like, oh! And then you see him bow and just shoots his hand. Yeah. So I've seen I've seen that before. Well, I've seen clearing malfunctions that happen, but I but I witnessed before a guy do it, and like I said, I, I uh, proceeded to provide aid to him, mm. um, and uh, he he shot a hole through his hand by shining the laser at it. He was showing his daughters. Ugh. He was showing his daughters the laser on his pistol out on the gun range. Shoots a hole through his hand. Uh, they come in, they freak out. They're like, like my dad shot. He's been shot. He's been shot. And I was like, no, he shot himself. He hasn't been <laughs> shot. <laughs> like, like he didn't get shot by somebody. He shot himself. And he, the guy swore up and down that the gun discharged. Tried to go through a whole lawsuit with Smith and Wesson to, you know, that it was. I'm like, oh, look, dude. At the end of the day, you just own up to it. You just shot yourself. Like, let's fix fix the problem. It's not life threatening. You just got a hole in your hand. We'll 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 patch you up. We'll call the cops. We'll call the ambulance. They'll come and get you, and you can go about your day. Like, but you shot yourself it, like that. It, yeah, it accidentally discharged, but yeah. where was it facing? Right, like, mm. it, like it, it was an accident, but my hand happened to be in front. Right, like why? Funny <laughs> enough, though, any of these people think about it. What what firearm? What cardinal safety rule did they break? Technically, well, they, they're breaking all of them. They're breaking. They're did, breaking. did they? The, well, they're breaking because they were obviously willing to destroy their hands. <laughs> so, I mean, okay. well, it, it, I mean, and well, and he, the, the, in his, well, in his mind, the firearm was unloaded treat everyone anyway, sorry. correct in his <laughs> mind and that's the that's the mindset though so so often and, and consequently every time i would be you know um it, it would be funny I, I wish i had old security camera footage i could probably find it and i could make a bunch of reels uh <laughs> but uh where i would hand a gun to somebody i would clear it i'd hand a gun to somebody over top of the counter and in the moment that i'd hand it to them the very first thing they do is it is they just I, you know i'm on the opposite side of the counter they just go straight up with the muzzle just like this and i and every, before i ever hand a gun to them i would hand the gun like and I would step off to the right or to the left because I knew immediately what they were going to do is the muzzle was going to come directly up to me. It didn't matter what their what their skill level was as far as what their knowledge was when it came to firearms and what their past history was, uh, what they did for a living. I had more guns pointed at me by people that were supposedly trained than 
people that were untrained and, and, and you would recognize, and, and I would, and I would almost be dancing back and forth playing like, like, you know, like, like doing the salsa with them, like kind of moving around the store behind the counter as they're waving the muzzle all around. And, and, uh, it, well, it became a point in time where like, like I just, I just pulled myself away from people because I almost he, got tired of saying. He would, he would literally, I'd watch this. He got to a point where he would say, yep, here you go. He'd show it clear, set it down, and then walk <laughs> yeah. walk away, like yeah. just out of out of yeah. kind of view. Like he could still see them, but just yeah. out the, of the way. The like the here day, you they, go, do they, do what you you're at, gonna do with it. At the end of the day, if they were gonna steal them, there was enough cameras in there. There's enough cameras pointing on the vehicle that they do. So like I just call the cops. I would you know they can chase them down. But I got tired of having firearms pointed at me so often. So I would do that, and then like I remember this one time, this uh, husband and wife was in there. And the husband, a.k.a., he was, you know, well-trained in knowledge and everything, knew everything that there was. Firearms expert. Yeah, firearms expert. He was a, he was a, he, he was, a, had, had three safes full of firearms and knew everything that you can possibly know about firearms. And he's breaking, you know, obviously, he, he's pointing it at, pointing it in my direction. I keep moving and his wife just keeps looking at me. She's got this look on her face. She's like, what's going on and she looks over at him and he's got the gun gun pointed basically aka in my direction and i move out of the way and she goes over to him and she takes the gun out of his hand nice and she says stop pointing the gun at him Mm. and the very first thing he turns around says it's unloaded fantastic yeah (laughs) <laughs> and so that's what she looks back and be like i didn't ask you a question yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, i mean that's why i said yesterday in the in the little thing with the kids you know i was like assume everybody that was ever shot negligently mm-hmm. was shot with an unloaded gun mm-hmm. right before, and we talk about it in class all the before time. you came down i was telling a story about my buddy that he shot himself in his leg because mm-hmm. he was he you know took out in the magazine and i don't know why i think he had it on his leg like maybe he was trying to take the slide off or yeah. something i don't know i wasn't there mm-hmm. all i know is he shot himself in the leg with his own gun mm. like, it, happens it, it happens more it, often than you think and yeah. you know what if it happens and and you know n- nothing traumatic happens from it you know and it just gives you that butthole pucker moment mm-hmm. you know where it discharges into a into the ground or into the floor of your home or whatever the first step is to owning up mm-hmm. that you screwed up. Yeah. Like made a you messed up, man up, take it for what it is. You screwed up. You broke some firearm safety rules. You become complacent is what happened. Um, and that's, that's where that's, but that's the problem though is, is when it does happen. And I've witnessed it so many times. Uh, I have had the opportunity um, to witness four individuals shoot themselves four times. So, um, Listen, indoor gun ranges are the wild, wild west. <laughs> so, so I have witnessed it uh, at least four times, and uh, and every single time, the very first thing that they said is it was unloaded. I used to keep a jar on my counter in the store, uh, and it and it said on the it, you know the big um, puff ball things, the things that you buy cheese at Sam's puffs. Called, cheese puffs. Oh, like yeah. I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sam. <laughs> where do you think we got the empty one yeah, from? Where do you think I got the empty one from? <laughs> I dumped it out. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, you did. So I had one of those. They're pretty big, right? Yeah. So I had one of those sitting on my counter, and I would just drop bullets, drop ammunition into it every time somebody would come into the store. Like, hey, do you got a holster for this gun? It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa let me see it. Let me, oh, yeah. let me. That's thing two. Two things. I can go on for days, guys. I can fill up like a twelve-hour <laughs> podcast talking about stories. One. People coming into a gun shop advocacy or just firearm advocacy mm-hmm. in general, okay? Coming into a gun shop. If you ever wonder why a gun shop has a sign on the door that says no loaded firearms, it's not because they're trying to take away your right for your abilities to still carry a firearm or to carry a firearm. At the end of the day, I respect your right to carry a firearm, but respect my right that I don't want to have a gun pointed at me. They come into the store, and they want to play show and tell. Or I had the very same gun right there on the counter, inside the counter. It's like, oh, man, I got that gun wanting to draw it out to show the person for whatever reason guys want to show off what they own you know what brother i'm proud of you but i have one of those here let me show them that you keep your gun armed on you i'd rather you be armed uh but like they 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 constantly do that and uh and it, okay let me check your gun and immediately i check the gun oh it's unloaded it's unloaded check your gun clear it out boom round comes out of the you know oh there's no mag in it it's unloaded Round comes out of the chamber, put it in my jar. Well, can I have that back? No, you cannot have that back. <laughs> You're lucky I'm going to give you your firearm back. <laughs> so, 
Mm. That's where it, it's almost like at, at uh, I always worry about, I always worry about, I'm always, I'm overly conscious about etiquette yeah. when yeah. it comes to stuff like that because of stories like that and mm-hmm. because people do that type of stuff. Yep. So like I, you know, if I'm going to bring something into a, uh, a gun store or something, basically treat it, treat it like you're dealing with a police officer. Mm-hmm. Then like, I have a firearm. I'm going to pull it out. Yeah. They're like, I'm, Probably I'm reaching for my for me. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, it go, it, to be honest, where it all stems from is that we've been already beating this horse to death with. Yeah. It goes back to the very beginning of situational awareness. Yes, and that does. goes to people who also own guns are not always situationally aware. In fact, most of them are not. And so when you talk about, like, we talk about survival and people surviving, you can have the tools to maybe equal the playing field or level the playing field, but you don't have the situational awareness. You're not paying attention. Your ego is too big to be able to pay attention to anything. You always know what everything's right. So you don't listen to advice or listen to the signs that are telling you, Hey, something's going on. Something's wrong. You have that normalcy bias. And that's where it's like people with guns also lack the will or the ability to survive. You know? Um, I mean, you got, well, because they rely, they, they believe that the, the gun is so much of an equalizer that that is their survival yeah that's 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 all they need they they now have that so uh and that what they lack obviously is the training yeah relying on the tool instead of the knowledge Correct. yeah the knowledge so what if as far as like if i had to generate like put a single word into what i've always seen steer specialists as in that career field is if i had to use one word to describe it is improv yeah oh, absolutely. improvisation yeah, yeah. yep absolutely. that's like what you guys Yep. And like, that's so a lot out. of times for, especially like, the older civilians, sadly, because I'm getting older. Um, but that's like where I use MacGyver as mm. an example. Is like I can I can make anything out of anything. Yeah. So it's it's about making it's about accomplishing what you need with what you have on hand, because you're not always going to have the perfect tool. You're not going to always have exactly what you need, but you need to get this mission done. So how are we going to do that with what we have available? Mm-hmm. And so yeah, it's it's. Yes, it's always better to have the right tool for the right job, but if you don't, you're going to have to figure out how to make it work. What are some what are some things that have happened in your past that are a good example of like some really interesting improv? Oh, man. Um load load carrying is a big one, you know, cuz you always have, you know, you always see people that carrying so much crap and you don't mm. always have a bag you know I don't, you always have your fanny pack yeah all right but like backpacks rucksacks anything like that but being able to improvise different ways to carry stuff mm. um so I, i've done that with my boys before we you know they'll want to carry something i have a water bottle all right and i'm like oh well do you have you know this do you have your your knot ropes you know or um i've done it with um like vines before or roots like you dig roots especially in florida because mm-hmm. everything's so moist it's really yeah. easy to use those so you dig up roots and make a little rope out of it and be like okay now you have a, a lanyard for your bottle you can wear like a bandolier and you have your hands are free yeah so that's stuff. actually a good one yeah it, there's it's, it's so much fun yeah. there's so yeah. much fun to be had out there just because it's just making stuff up yeah. just making it up as you go mm-hmm. you know and they'll and you know um that's such a technique too that they're learning in that moment that they don't even think that they're actually doing it's just like they're it's just kind of fun yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. It, it's a it's a privilege that they're not aware of, and they won't figure out until years down the road yeah. when other kids don't understand how to function like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they're going to be leaps and bounds above their friends because their friends were staying and playing roadblocks or whatever, and we were out, you know, eating grass. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Playing manhunt in the woods, barefoot. You make seer specialists sound like the ultimate rednecks. Oh, that's <laughs> oh, no, well, Legit- I, I legitimately it. minus the moonshine. Well, no. Sometimes <laughs> <laughs> I, say, I tell Eric all the time. I said uh, my my knowledge when it comes to you know uh, survival is 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 growing up in a rural area, and that we would we would we would just go play manhunt in the woods. So we we'd leave school on Friday, come home, drop our bags off at the house, grab a few things that we could shove in our pockets or in a backpack, jar of peanut butter, whatever it is, and then head out into the woods. And then we would have like twenty dudes like that would come out and we'd go play manhunt in the woods for an entire weekend and we'd come home Sunday evening and that's 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 what we did we'd be gone the entire weekend and and I remember the first time I, I learned how to clean or actually uh, do a snare trap and then and then clean a rabbit um, this old guy that lived behind us he uh, Harold he was super super knowledgeable but uh, he's like he's like we were w- walking back because we used his property to get into the woods and he's like hey you boys want to learn how to get a rabbit and I was like yeah so he shows us 
all that cleans this rabbit i'm sitting there like looking at this and he just rips the rips the hide rips the fur right off of it is, is that like, how he did did he yeah. pull it off like a sweater yeah yep. yep. just, yep, just pulled it off like a sweater yeah and my eyes are like this i'm like 11 12 years old <laughs> sure enough though it worked right yeah. so we got out in the woods and our entire goal we didn't even play manhunt we just literally all there was like eight of us that weekend we just tried to catch as many rabbits as we possibly could <laughs> <laughs> and uh and feed ourselves off of that so yeah. but yeah mine, mine is all uh i guess redneck engineering so, it's, yeah, it's legitimately the same thing yeah it's redneck it's, engineering yeah so what so my 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 grandfather his name was jerry Mm-hmm. Um, and so I always, I always heard the term jerry rigging yeah. mm. and I always attribute that to my grandfather cause he was the same exact way. Yeah. Nice. He was, a, he was a, a plumber back in the day. He was a, a plumber in our, our small town. So everybody knew him. Everybody knew me as, you know, Jerry's grandkid. Um, but the same thing, he would always just be able to just figure things out and just make it work. And it was just that generation. Yeah. yeah. You know, it, there was no like, oh, well, I don't have the right thing. I guess I'll just have to wait or mm-hmm. oh, Amazon prime it, you know, it's yeah. like, you just, you got to get it done, do it, mm-hmm. figure yeah. it out. Yeah, we didn't have anything. We do. I mean, you know, which, like I said, we dump out our books out of our backpacks and head into the woods. And you know, I was looking up for my mom. She's like, "What are you doing with our bread and peanut butter?" I'm like, "Well, I'm gonna feed like 20 dudes." <laughs> feeding the village. Yeah. <laughs> I'm feeding yeah. the village. She's like, she's like, "No, we need that for this upcoming week for you to have lunch at school." Well, I'm like, I'll, I'll hustle lunch when I'm at school. I'll figure that out. But I need yeah. it for this weekend. I need it to go into the woods with. I remember out there finding you know blackberries or oh, wild strawberries, yeah. dandelions, and you yeah. find you know just finding stuff to eat out there you know you go go to your neighbors uh like pear trees or whatever yeah Yeah. dude i always found it fascinating you know talking about traps and snares is always we actually did it at that camp out but we did like it was a snare where you have like a pulley system that closes a loop around an animal what are some things that are if i was going to go out and i had to go snare some animals maybe some small game right what are some things to keep in mind about animal characteristics and what to probably a good rule of thumb when it comes to snares for a beginner. So one of the biggest things, and I didn't cover this when we were out there because kids, yeah. they can't absorb all They just want to see them, something cool. Yeah, so yeah. Like, hey, pretend it's a rabbit. Rawr! All right, no, yeah. it's dead. Um, but um, is being, their sense of smell, smell is so mm-hmm. sensitive. So you can't, like we were down there for like 10 minutes setting up this snare. Mm-hmm. Like they're going to be able yeah. to smell that. They're going to know something's wrong and they're mm-hmm. not going to want to go near there. Yep. So if you're preparing the snare, you got to be really careful about your scent on your hand. So when you're using, you know, using dirt and stuff to kind of cover up your scent as you're making the snare, try to touch it as little as possible. Mm. So that way you're not leaving that scent. Um, you know, when you actually find out where you're going to place it, try to I, try to identify it from a distance. Look for a natural funnel. So you you know you're looking for game trail. I, sh- I guess we should have started with that. But if you yeah. if you're snaring, you probably already know you're doing that. Mm. Right, looking for a natural game trail that you're gonna be able to set this up on. Try to identify what's if you can observe it for a long time. Try to identify what's running through there because that's gonna determine how big you're gonna make the loop. You know if, or what however you're gonna you know if you want to try to strangle it with a loop or if you want to try and do like a deadfall where you smash it with a rock or a log. Which I don't really like that mm-hmm. um, because it's you know smashing everything so mm-hmm. you're going to taint the meat and and it dies right away and then you don't know how long it's dead mm-hmm. so that's why i like i like trying to i like trying to catch it live mm-hmm. because it's going to be there when you get there and it's still fresh so that's kind of a, a handy Breathe. thing is it me no i just hear it. No. i hear it. Oh. That's probably me. <laughs> I'm, gu- I'm guilty of that too. I always, let, I, I, I'm always, I always do deep breathing. Like, yeah. I, not intentionally. It's yeah. just what my body does. My wife's like, "What's wrong?" And I'm like, "Nothing." You just sighed. I'm like, "I no." My I wife just to. tells me it's, to stop it, breathing. It's hot. <laughs> yeah. yeah, She's like, it's, well, "It's hot in here look today." You over, yeah. Look at you over there breathing. Yeah. <laughs> I did some deep breathing when I was diving last week, and there's a lot of sharks. I was breathing yeah. real hard. But anyway, sorry to interrupt. We were saying yeah. so. Um, so yeah, so watch it for that. Looking for that natural funnel, and then if you if you need to add anything to it. Just try to make it look as natural as possible. Um, make sure that whatever you line you have or whatever you're using to snare it is going to be suitable for whatever you're trying to catch so it doesn't break free. I've had that happen before where I've tried. I tried to use snare wire, but I used, I can't remember what I used, but it was it was apparently too weak because mm-hmm. whatever I was trying to grab just ripped off and kept running. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of stuff that goes into it. Um, you know, where you do, you do in the pin toggle um, and the, the weight that we had for the counterbalance in order to actually elevate the, the animal. Oh, that was the other thing, too. Is we, so we did a, a pin and toggle where basically you have um, uh, two pieces of wood that kind of hook into one another. Mm-hmm. And then that is tied to a loop. And so when the animal runs through it, it makes the top pin slide off. And then we had that toggle hooked up to a rope that was up and over a branch and then tied to a log on the other side. So as soon as that pulled off, it lifted the animal up. Um, does a couple different things. One, if the animal's off the ground, they're not going to be able to get traction in order to try to run away and 
you know, rip up the stake that the uh, the loop was tied to or whatever. Also, it's going to keep it high enough that predators won't be yeah, able to get to say. it. If you catch a rabbit or a squirrel, it starts screaming. Mm -hmm. A fox or coyote or something is going to come and try to get it. If it's high enough, they're not going to be able to get to it. So you're still going to have your animal there when you come to it. I was fascinated the first time I heard a rabbit scream. Oh, dude, I was, like I was 18 wanna... years old, and I had no idea that rabbits could make that noise. It literally sounds like a baby being murdered. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm going to do back <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, <laughs> dude, dude. I, I remember the rabbit that I had also because they were like giving the students rabbits. Like, all right, here you go. This is yours. And I'm like, I watch and I can hear. We had like we call them a beat stick. <laughs> and the guy before me, he like lays the ears down, calms it down, and beats this flipping rabbit in the back of the head. And just hearing that that sound, I was like, 18 years old. Never. I was like. Start, I could feel it start to come up. I was like, I can't throw them for all the other people. Dude, you're lucky you got a clean hit. I've seen, I, I don't, I don't, I never, let, I very rarely let students do it because so often they'd get nervous or whatever and they would miss. Yes, yeah. Clock them in the spine, break their spine. They'd be screaming. I'm like, I like, I'm, I'm all about killing things to eat. Mm. But if you're, if you're not going to eat it or if you're going to kill it, you better make it fast, man. Like yeah. there's no creature on this earth deserves to be tortured like that. Yeah. So it was like, it's got to be humane. Yeah, I'm not like I'm. I'm not all you know, bunny hugging and stuff like that. I have no problem killing an animal, but it's got to be humane, and I'm going to use every single part of it. Yeah. Well, that's just called being a good steward, which God already called yeah. us to do in the Bible, anyways, is to be good stewards of what uh, of creation. Um, but yeah, that's. I've always I never would have gotten the opportunity to, but I've always wanted to catch a big animal, yeah, like a big game animal with a snare, and I've always wanted to catch fish. So whether it was like whether they were like a oh, snare dude. pole or like a funnel. Like it's just fast. There's something that uh, when you catch that animal, because I remember I caught some squirrels with the uh, what do they call those things? The it has a fur catch. It's just a, a simple wire snare that you would stick. So I like what essentially it is. There's a stick on the on against a tree, and I put these little oh, okay, wire yeah. snares all yeah. around it. I caught three squirrels, dude. I was so proud of myself. I caught one squirrel though. I felt so bad. I caught him by the tail, and oh. the next morning, because I was in, I we went in the winter. He was frozen solid, and I was like, oh, poor guy. That's like, crap, die, yeah. dude. But, yeah, I got three squirrels. Speaking of being good, Stuart, uh, did, did you want to hit on good practices when you're laying snares? Aside from a survival situation, but most of the time you're going to you're gonna put out as many as you can. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, you're, but you're, if you're... somebody's going to go out and, and do snares, which in most places it's actually frowned upon. Yeah. yeah. But you if you are, don't. License. Yeah. Do not leave them out there. Yes, mm. like, you got to flag. Yeah, if you're going to lay out snares, flag them like close by. No, one, know how many you put out, mm -hmm. and then when you go to pick them up, pick up. You know, check all of them, pick up all of them. Um, you know, flag a tree nearby so that way you know where they are. So if you mm -hmm. if you get, you can, and then make sure you count them, pick them up, and then check them often enough. Yeah, I just um, know somebody in the comments is going to be like, "Oh, you shouldn't, you shouldn't leave them out and yeah, do all and that." And also, what we're talking about here is survival right. situation. Right. Like, you, you, like don't go out and just do this just for you know S and Gs. Like, go out. Yeah. If, if you're going to survive, if you need to catch this in order to feed yourself or your family, that's when you're doing this. In which case, yeah, you're gonna check every snare because <laughs> you need that food. I mean, if we got 50 million people coming into the country and food starts running out, yeah you might have to end up starting to figure out how to procure food on your own. What is the, why, why would somebody be more inclined to put out snares for a survival situation outside of just hunting? Well, okay. Well, one, it's not loud. So if you're out there shooting a gun, somebody's going to come look, especially in a situation where food is scarce. If somebody hears a gun out in the woods, they're going to know that you're hunting and they might come and try to take what's yours, which would not end well for them if you're out there with a gun, but regardless. Um, so, and it's, it's passive. So mm -hmm. it's going to take a lot less energy for me to set a couple snares on a, on a game trail or, you know, up a, uh, I can't remember what that pole is called, but I know what you're talking about. I caught, I caught a, a chipmunk like that in Alaska. Yeah. Our seer instructor was like, or excuse seer specialist, <laughs> seer specialist was like, yeah, man, just stick a pole up there. They're lazy. They'll just run up that. Thing. Yeah. So you, you just take a, 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 st a, a log stick thick enough that it's not going to break or anything like that. Lean it like a 45 up mm -hmm. against a tree. And then you put. Uh, and it has to be wire because you have to. It has to be able to be manipulated. So if you're using a string or something, it's just going to lay down. It's not going to work. Um, so some type of uh, copper wire, brass wire, whatever is going to um, be firm enough that you can shape it and hold it at the right angle, um, but thin enough that it's going to close on whatever's trying to run through it. And when you're laying those, you have to have them low enough, close enough to whatever th the thing's running on that it's not going to run over it, but high enough that its legs won't go through. 
So it's mm-hmm. got to be just just off the surface, whatever you're laying it to. So that way their feet go underneath and their head goes through it. And the cool thing about squirrels and chipmunks is they just they run around everything. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can place these snares like almost like spiral mm-hmm. around, you know, three dimensions around this stick. It's not just one single uh, one single path. Mm-hmm. So it's more likely you're going to catch them. Yeah. Uh, and the general ratio is, I think it's like seven to one or something. Oh, wow. So you, you set out seven seven snares hoping to catch one animal. Mm-hmm. And that, that's actually probably low depending on where you are. Wow. I mean, the good thing about Florida is there's an abundance of animals. Yeah, there's an abundance of uh, tree tree rodents, for sure. Yeah. They're all over the place. So there's a park yeah. that my boys and I go to. We call it Squirrel Park because yeah. they're just, they're everywhere. Yeah. I wouldn't even have to set a trap because they just come right up to yeah. you, like, asking for food. Yeah, they're so, so they're so used to being fed by humans. Yep. So. Mm. By the way, if you live in Florida, don't feed alligators. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and no. if you don't live in Florida and you come to Florida and you want to see an alligator, don't feed alligators. Don't feed the alligators. Don't feed the alligators. Yeah. So I can't wait for the apocalypse so I can eat a manatee. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot manatee of manatee steak. There's a lot of meat on that. I, is it a lot of meat or is it a lot of fat? <laughs> it's a lot of fat. Okay. Yeah. I'm not I'm not saying I won't eat that. Yeah. I'm just, you know, I'm yeah. wondering how much actual meat is mm-hmm. there. You could probably yeah. make a good lantern or something. Oh bet. Gonna have a great I, sea ribeye. <laughs> I would, man. So I, when I was when I was in Alaska, we made uh, candles out of whale blubber. Really? That was so cool. I still have it because wow. that was that cool. So just a little tin can with a piece of like webbing, and then we we rendered down male blu- whale blubber, male blubber. Maybe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, if they're dead already, they, you got to use it for something. Yeah, yeah. But uh, and then that little can heated up our snow cave. It was really cool because uh, you know, up in Alaska, it's you know negative 20 negative 30 outside and we're all bundled up moving around and stuff like that and then you get inside your snow cave and the snow cave can't be any warmer than 32 degrees otherwise it's going to melt all the snow Mm. so the snow cave is you know 15 20 degrees and i've got pictures of me and my teammates sitting there in our underwear sitting in a snow cave because even though it's 20 degrees it's still 60 degrees warmer Mm. than it is outside so you come in it's like a heat wave Mm. and this little candle can heat up this this snow cave to you know 20 25 degrees or whatever and it makes it very comfortable to live in wow speaking of alaska this is one so as far as story time wise goes um in your training or in your in your in your journey um what what is probably like the the worst place that you've had an opportunity to train in or be in or the worst conditions that you've been put in open ocean yeah open ocean yeah because it's like there's there's no water yeah. there's no food like you you can get stuff but it, you have to be so much more clever and you have to and there but there's no way to escape anything if there's bad weather if the sun's out if it's raining if there's rough sea like there's nothing you can mm. do mm. like i would rather be anywhere else other than open ocean tom, tom um, hanks did it yeah absolutely yeah <laughs> well i didn't have a volleyball yeah yeah um, <laughs> But he, he didn't either after. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry. So, was that a training exercise or? Uh, yeah, several, several, several yeah, of them. Yeah. And, and and the cool thing is it, it forces you to be so much more ingenuitive with what you're doing. So when we have these um, these LPUs, all right, which are the, the life preserver units. Mm-hmm. And the ones we had were the underwing ones. So they're the orange, like, like kidney bean shaped inflatables. And so I was like, you know what? I'm willing to bet I could make a solar still out of that. And so I cut a little hole in it, rinsed out the talc powder it was inside. Otherwise, you'll be, you know, painting trees. It'll be nasty. Yeah. Um, so I rinsed that out. I filled it halfway with salt water, and then I clamped it, clamped it off with the, the Life Raft Repair Kit. It's just a little plug that just closes it back up. And then, I, and then I inflated it, and then I draped it over the raft. And so as it heated up in the sun, the salt water would evaporate from one side, mm-hmm. condense on the top, and then collect down on the other side. And then you had fresh water on one side. As long as there wasn't rough seas, it worked out pretty all right. Wow. Did you have any luck fishing? Uh, no. Yeah. No, not in the open ocean. No. I, now, I'm sure if I was out there long enough, you could. Um, and the, and the, the, the good thing and the bad thing is while you're out there, obviously, you're going to get sick. You're going to vomit. You're going to defecate. You're in it, whatever. And all these little fish are going to come out and start mm-hmm. eating on that stuff. And so when you can get creative and try to use nets to catch those little fish and then use those little fish to catch bigger fish and so on and so forth until you get whatever you need. Try to create some type of sabiki. But the problem, the problem is, yeah, and that's the cool thing too, is all any, any saltwater fish you can eat without mm-hmm. cooking. You don't have to cook it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you catch something big enough, you can slice it really thin, lay it on the raft or stretch it out and then air dry it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you've got, you know, fish for a while. Yeah. Um, but the, the problem with all that is I've seen it several times too, where people are trying to prepare things on the raft and they pull out a knife and they end up cutting the raft. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of, a lot of things you got to be aware of in that situation too. Then you're no longer in the ocean. You're up a Creek instead. <laughs> <laughs> how long, how long, how long were you out? 
Um, so I think the, uh, the, the longest was probably like 12 hours. Okay. So it's not, not a super long time, but enough to realize it sucks. Yeah. Yeah. What is the, do you know any stories of people who survived on the ocean as a good example for the fact that it can be done? Yeah. I, you know, not off the top of my head and that's where, but I, there are several and I've, I've got, I've got books and books and books of stories that I have. So that way, if I'm teaching a lesson or anything like that, I have this material to fall back on. Mm. Um, but one thing I really want to point out, I'm glad you brought that up is there's so many people, examples of people that have drank salt water mm. and then have survived to people like, oh, well, you can drink salt water. This guy did it. Like, no, 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 no. He didn't survive off of salt water. He survived in spite of salt water. Yeah. Right? Drinking salt water is not just the salt that's going to get you. It's all the heavy metals and stuff that's inside there that'll actually start seeping through your your blood brain barrier and actually start making you hallucinate. Go mad, you, yeah. Oh, dude, it is it's horrendous. Mm. Um, so there are a lot of bad stuff coming from seawater. So you just never ever ever drink that. Mm. Yeah. And while I'm while I'm here, everybody always asks me this as a seer guy, never drink your own urine. <laughs> I knew it was I don't it I was... don't care if it's sterile and you like the taste. Like yeah. just don't do it. It like, was coming. And my wife, she said, Can you ask him if you can drink in your own urine? You you absolutely can. <laughs> you can. <laughs> you shouldn't. Well in water you world can. you can. So, he has a machine. So Eric, no, okay, no, I'm, now I'm, see. I'm feeling personally I, attacked right <laughs> now. I have, I have done that. Yeah. All right, you can pure you can Purify is not the right word, but you you can make it a little better. Yeah. So, <laughs> listen, I've, I've got a Grail water bottle. I drink my urine every day there you go. just All to right. stay healthy, just to so prove a point. It's filtered. Yeah. So, well, the, the funny—I don't know if you guys remember or if you guys paid attention to this for a while. The UFC guys were doing auto urotherapy, where you drink one ounce of your own urine per day. I don't remember why, but it's supposed to have some type of like effect on your body, and so I was like. They probably got knocked out. That like, sounds about right. Dude, I'm not. New, I'm gonna mix new. it with my collagen, and we'll see. Like, I I'll report even, back to you. I couldn't even. I couldn't even think about. Like a lot of times, people do crazy stuff, and I was like, oh, I wonder. And I'll like think about it for a little while. I wonder if I should do it or not. I didn't even. Didn't even think cross my it. mind. But I have drank my own urine in the in the case of I was in uh, in the desert, and I built a solar still where you dig a, a hole in the ground, and then you put a, a water collection device in the middle of the hole. You cover it with a, a, a vapor barrier, some type of plastic or, you know, something that uh, water can't leak out of. And then you can pour unpurified water inside the hole. Or in my case, you can just pee around the outside of the hole. And then the, the ground will absorb the moisture. It'll evaporate through the sun, condense on the top of the plastic, and then collect down inside the, the container. <laughs> the problem is all of that water will taste like whatever you made that with. Mm. All right, so it's going to taste a little bit like pee. Mm. Right, if you're in the middle of the desert and you put um, vegetation in there, it also extract the, the moisture out of the vegetation. Well, sagebrush, it tastes like pea-laced whiskey. Mm. So it, what like, I'm really hearing bad. is you can have a little bit of urine as a treat. Yeah. As a treat. <laughs> Only if you're good. Yeah. Only if you're good. Just a shot. Just I will actually shot. say that, at, you know, when doing JTAC stuff, we had, I had this SATCOM antenna. We called it the Coke can or the beer bottle, but essentially it was an X-wing and you would pull down on the sleeve and it would pop these four wings out to get SATCOM uh, calm. So, um, one of the things that was crazy is we were out down South in the desert and I had a spike, we call it the spike of death. And I would pee on the ground and then I would stick the exact comm antenna if I couldn't get comms. I wasn't just like, yep, I'm peeing. That's my standard operating procedure is just pee on the ground no matter what. I would try to angle it. And if I couldn't get it, I would just pee on the ground, stick the exact comm antenna, and I'd get clear comms every time. Hmm. Witchcraft. That's how it's done. <laughs> yeah. Um, so when did you ever have any experiences in like the jungle of like South America and how those people or maybe different indigenous people from around the world survived or did things that were just kind of interesting uh, y yes and no it, it's really just about how they use the environment mm. but it's also it's one of those things where like oh man i should really you, it seems like such a good idea but i should do what they do and then you realize they're collecting water from the same river that they're urinating defecating in mm. downstream and i'm like wait a second <laughs> I remember one time I was I was swimming I was swimming in this creek. We were all playing with the locals and stuff like that. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, that's a weird looking stick. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> it's poop. That's not a stick. <laughs> oh god, um, this is why they don't have electricity. We've all seen the, that in the local pools. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's a baby. No, it's a baby roof. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <it's> a baby. <laughs> um, but yeah, so like you know they how they know so much about their environment, and that's one thing that we've lost as Americans is like who does? Oh that? yeah, dude. But you they they. You know, so much, like they can tell which ones are the water vines. There's actual vines that would contain water in it, and so you'd actually cut them at a uh, 45 degree angle, um, cut it straight across. It actually creates like a suction. So you got to cut it at a 45 degree angle, and then you collect that into 
a device that you can pour it straight in your mouth. A lot of times it'll have like little, not necessarily needles, but um, the debris on the outside, the bark can be kind of an irritant. So like when you see him like, is it a predator or something like that, where he like chops the vine and he starts sucking out of it like a straw, he'd get blisters all up in his mouth. I, 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 yeah. Anything survival wise, I'm watching on the movies. I'm like, that's ridiculous. My, <laughs> wife, my wife's like, just shut up and watch the movie. Yeah. But um, yeah, so we, like, we can't watch stuff like that together. Yeah. Um, it's like, yeah, I've just been cutting vines and sucking straight from them yeah, and yeah. Uh, sauteing <laughs> some poison ivy. That's how it is with us in gun handling. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I bet. I bet. Anybody. And that's the thing. I tell my wife this all the time because she's she does like occupational safety type stuff. And so she's a real nerd, like absolute nerd. She knows like OSHA regs and stuff like that. I'm like, oh. you're such a nerd. But then the more I real, the more I think about it, I'm like, everybody's a nerd. Yes. They're just a nerd for what they're passionate about mm. so there's football nerds. i don't care if you you want to call yourself a jock cool but you're a football nerd yeah like that you're just nerdy about a, a, a different thing yeah jokes on you roman i don't know anything about anything <laughs> <laughs> i'm not a nerd i'm a yeah. nerd about not being a nerd yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah that's that's uh i've always found that kind of fascinating that we have you know all these skill sets from our ancestors and stuff like that that we've just kind of lost i remember one time you know, on the military side, like going to that survival class and it was like one person was like, I've never started a fire or like I've never been in the woods because it came from the city. Yeah. Oh, I've seen, yeah, I've seen that. It's like the what? only the only tree I've seen is planted in my sidewalk. Yeah. It's like, what? That's so weird. Where are you from? Yeah. But on the flip side, like I, I could not survive in the city mm. oh, like, I agree. like mentally, like physically I could do it. Sure. Why not? But mentally I, I would go insane. So yeah. somebody from like me that has pretty much spent their entire life growing up in a relatively very rural area where it used to take us 45 minutes to an hour to get to a grocery store um and just spending so much time in the woods i remember the first time i actually went to like a major city like new york like mm. like i'm like man this is a this is a dump yes yeah, yeah, this is yeah, a what, sewer. what you say what you say new york smells like it's it's oh, yeah. it's, it's it's a toilet bowl yep. it smells like urine Absolutely. it just smells like urine and everything's like, sticky like, and smells I, like urine i'm like mm-hmm. I'm, i would die here like i there's no way i don't even know if i could figure out a way to survive i don't know if i yeah. can <laughs> if i could figure it out like, I, would, just, I would survive but my soul would die yeah like it yeah. would just i would be yeah. in a shell of myself yeah. speaking of when we saw that movie civil war some of those cities i was like they look worse now <laughs> right. than they pictured it yeah, in that no, movie the, the, civil, <laughs> yeah. the civil war movie definitely made the big cities look look eh, this place is comfortable yeah. we could go there mm-hmm. Have you guys seen, there's been some side-by-side pictures of like uh, i am legend and like cities nowadays and they're like yeah it's pretty darn yeah. close <laughs> wow like, really it's yeah. it's yeah if you look it up it's crazy man yeah actually and i am legend all those guys all the the people huddling in one of the buildings that's like kind of like the immigrants now yeah. <laughs> in the cities. dude uh, i mean that actually squatting in a house just that, 20 of them that'd be actually kind of interesting is like say for example you do come across like like let's just say for example in ukraine they've got let's just say you're you know you're separated from your combat unit or whatever and you're now out of supplies and trying to survive, and you're in an urban environment that's dilapidated. And how do you survive in that? You know, there's no nature, there's no animals. Like same do do? same way. Uh, who was it? Owen Wilson, Behind Enemy Lines. Oh, that was a good movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure that was spot on. What yeah, do you think, yeah. Roman? How was that evasion? No, if you had to rate that evasion, no, that was no, it was legit. Uh, what, what, one thing I love is how they accurately depict that you can run faster than landmines. So if you like, impressive. if you're walking through yeah. a corridor and there's trip wires everywhere, if you just run fast enough, they'll just blow up behind you. Yeah. <laughs> and as long as you don't look at them, they won't hurt you. Yeah. That's a cool are, you guy, cool that, are you saying that's not how it works? No, no, no. That was a documentary. <laughs> that was an absolute uh, straight up. Yep. Yeah. And then as soon as you finish your water, you should throw away your collection device because there's no way you're going to get water again. So there's no reason to have something that you can hold yeah. water with. Well, he's planning on drinking his urine. So he's oh, yeah. 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 Well, was, I don't. I he was don't, 200 IQ. Carry, who wants to carry the extra weight? Yeah. yeah. Ugh. <laughs> Empty water bottle. <laughs> that's heavy it's slow him down he, know- he wouldn't be able to outrun the uh the mines then yeah, yeah uh, touche <laughs> I'm gonna slow him down mm-hmm. yeah the um one of the, so what are some things that like if i'm what are the basic needs that somebody has to have in order to work their survival so one thing i want to bring up real quick is uh, it's right along those lines one thing i didn't mention before i was mm-hmm. getting ready to and then we tangent but um is picking up a local plant book Mm. wherever you're living just get a plant book it'll talk all about medicine it'll talk all about food it'll talk about you know poisonous plants and stuff like that so being aware of your local flora and fauna is going to be brilliant Mm. being able to identify what plants you have what you can use and it's simple too like there's not you don't have to know all of them and that we talk about this with the edibility test like if you don't know if you can eat something 
you go through the editability test. And I don't want to go through it, but it's a way to find out whether it's poison or not without actually ingesting it and then just either dying or not. Mm. Um, you want to find something that's abundant and then identify that, especially if you're, if you're always going to be in central Florida, you're going to have the same plants. Mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're along the same latitude. So no matter where you go, you're going to have very, very similar plants. So if you can find a couple few plants that you can use for different food sources, you're going to find those everywhere and you're going to be able to live off of those. No. So wherever you live, and so I've got, because I was in the military, so, you know, moved all over the place. Every time I got to a new place, I bought a couple of books about the local, local plants. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, you always you can always have that book along for reference too if you need it. That's yeah, that's what I'm saying. Well, well, I, I always need it. My brain is just it's not what it used to be. So yeah, I, here in Florida, we have one of the most abundant food sources than any other state: swamp cabbage. We do. Yeah, palm heart. Were, were we talking? Oh about yeah, that? I did hear. So yeah, Jordan was actually telling me about this. It's called. It's what you want to talk about, Issa? Yeah. So in the uh, the heart of a palm, any of these palm trees. You, you you cut it down you know to the to the trunk and then in inside of the trunk is a heart is the heart and you can actually just chop that up like cabbage put it in a stew supposedly it's pretty good it is yeah I've never had it but it's the plant that looks like it has like spikes sticking out everywhere mm -hmm. it's a tree but it looks like it has like these long stick spikes okay. all over the place and it's it's, it's, it's a, your palmettos palmettos oh, okay. yeah. All right, yeah, yeah yeah so your yeah not the palm trees not the yeah. tall ones it's, they're it's the palm shorter palm. ones like was... in the scrublands and and by our swamps and yeah it's in this particular area, and you know, as you get into South Florida area, there's, there's, you know, when you see the greenery that looks like palm leaves, that's relatively low to the ground. Uh, they actually use it too. Uh, people that uh, make uh, like Cuban bread and stuff like that, they'll cut the palm fronds off, and then you know, you ever look at like homemade or like fresh Cuban bread that like almost like that stringy stuff that's on top, baked on top of it, mm -hmm. that's actually palm fronds. Okay. So, yeah, they use ice. Mm. But if you dig down deep enough, you can get actually get to the root, the heart of it, like they were talking about, uh, swamp cabbage, and it, it, it's actually it's actually very delicious. So mm. uh, you can get down to the root. It has a lot of moisture, has a lot of water in it. So oh, yeah, I'm going to have to get on that. Florida, yeah, Florida has an abundance of food. Yeah. I mean, and I it's year-round. Florida also it, has a lot of stuff that will kill you. Yeah, true. yeah, so, yeah. I, I've heard people compare Florida to Australia and that we're all, like, we're both pretty messed up because everything's trying to kill you all yeah. the time. Well, that's why I like the, the swamp cabbage because I joke with my son all the time about, you know, I got him the, you know, southeast and uh, central Florida-like plant books on edible plants and herbs. The problem is I'm like, Gabriel, for everything you see in that book that's edible, there's something that looks just like it that will kill you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah, there's, uh, there's, I mean, like, if you have to think about, I mean, I've thought about because people I've had, I mean, I've had some friends that have moved out of the state, and they're like, ah, oh, I just got to get off the grid and just go somewhere, you know, be able to get some land to survive. And I'm like, dude, you're going up north, and that's where winter kills people. Like, yeah. down here, we get a little bit of chill, but you got, as far as, like, edible things to eat, there's lizards everywhere. You got iguanas. You got tons of hogs everywhere. Oh. Like, as far as food sources and Water born or water food sources is an abundant because everything is lush here, so everything thrives. So yeah, you can you like, like you said, there's squirrels and and you know all sorts of other animals and birds, like crazy amount of birds. Yeah, and especially like here near Lakeland, there's so much water all over the place. We can just fish wherever you want. Fun fact: I found this out from the local reptile store because Zane's really addicted to reptiles. There are chameleons that you can f catch in Lakeland. Mm -hmm. because they were they were pets and people will let them go just like anaconda or not anacondas but the pythons they let them go and they just flourished yeah florida so, has a big problem with uh people buying um exotic animals and just letting them go, <laughs> them go. So i'm gonna I, be eating a lot of gator and, and, and our environment's better than the environment that they come from yeah so. i i heard a rumor and this is just a rumor i like putting this out here because I, I don't like saying stuff that i haven't confirmed myself but i heard a rumor that like apparently chameleon raising is a huge thing and they thrive so well in the natural environment that people will get chameleons, they'll breed them, and then let them go, and that you know they just and then they thrive, and then they go when they're mature enough, they'll go c collect them and then resell them. Hmm. And so, and then a lot of people are getting in trouble because like kids will go out and catch a chameleon, and then the guy that's actually raising them knows that that's their habitat. We'll see them see kids out there trying to catch the chameleons, get all ticked off at them. Hmm. Hmm. It wouldn't surprise me. An easy way of just you know let them grow and and, yeah. and mature it's kind of like you, permaculture but for really really low breeding yep. yeah speaking of rumors did you hear the rumor about butter go ahead well, we're not gonna spread it so <laughs> yeah gosh dad joke for I days do, i love i love that <laughs> they, they've already heard it <laughs> yeah. twice today I still so. laugh, <laughs> what was the other one that you said it was it you or is it, it you me? yeah you said it i don't know maybe what was it i don't remember i was asking you <laughs> was it about the clowns 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. How do you kill a group of clowns? You go for the juggler. <laughs> Classic. Classic. Well, um, <laughs> I don't even know how to Thanks, reply Roy. After that. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Roy. Yeah. Thanks for laughing. I adore you. Yeah. The, I, uh, I pretty much laugh at any dad. Yeah, yeah. That, so. uh, I'm a sucker for them. So kind of going back to the survival thing, what are some basic things or categories that people need to think about whenever they're trying to survive? Right, so obviously just going through your basic needs okay. and, th and thinking about your environment. What obviously, are your like, basic needs? All right, so you're going to need, you know, obviously um, personal protection, which is going to cover your shelter mm. and as well as your clothing and equipment. Right. All right. And then when you have all that stuff, making sure you're taking care of it. We use what's called the colder principle. All right, so you want to make sure you're keeping everything clean, so keeping it off the ground. Um, you and this this goes this goes into a lot more than just your gear because the O is going to cover for uh, avoid overheating. Mm. So wearing your clothing loose and layered. So if you're going to start work, layer down. So while you're working, especially down here in Florida with humidity and stuff like that, um, try to avoid overheating by sweating too much. Mm. Um, so laying, 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 wearing it loose and layered, the L, um, making sure that it's dry. That's going to be a big one down here too because if the humidity is high and you're sweating and you're getting wet, it's going to be really hard to dry that stuff. Yeah. Uh, so wringing it out, put it out in the, uh, luckily it's not that bad here as much as like Central America and, you know, a little bit further South. Um, but if you lay it out in the sun, even though there's humidity here, it will dry out eventually. So that's going to be good. The worst thing you could be is, I don't know how often you spend like just soaking wet, but it sucks. Like that is miserable mm. just being wet all the time. Um, so trying to keep all your gear dry, especially here is going to avoid it from rusting as well. So that's going to help examine it, rep uh, examine it daily. And if it needs repair it. So that's the, mm. the colder principle. Um, so your, your shelter. So thinking about that and you, you're teaching with the boys, you're teaching how to put up a poncho shelter and then yeah. realizing you can do it with anything. You don't have to have a poncho. Mm. So just thinking outside of, you know, trash bags, any, any type of waterproof or water resistant material. And if it's not water resistant, if you have a strong, a, a high enough, a, a steep enough pitch and it's tight enough, it'll repel water anyway. So, you know, in a heavy mm. rain, you'll get wet, but it'll, it'll keep you a little bit drier. Yeah. Um, but think so a lot of times I'll keep that stuff in my truck or I'll keep it available, you know, some type of tarp or you know what we call the visqueen which is the the pallet cover is just really thick plastic whatever you can do um making sure you have good equipment so i i like to have a fixed blade knife and a folding blade knife folding blade knife is good for small work if you're you know you're starting to skin an animal or anything anything small you don't want to have to pull out a big old you know six inch long uh, fixed blade knife is going to be more cumbersome mm. um, but good solid knives so uh, something with a full tang where the the metal from the blade goes all the way through the handle um, and a lot of knives out there, I, I don't know if there's a tangent or not, but knives, a lot of knives out there will say they're full tang, but it'll just have like a strip of metal that mm -hmm. goes through the handle. So you, like, one, uh, I don't want to advertise any particular knife, but if you can look at the handle and you can see the bits of handle on either side and the blade itself is still going through so you can see how thick that blade is, how thick that, uh, that metal is that you're actually holding on to. Because um, with a good fixed knife, you're going to be able to do pretty much anything. You're going to be able to chop down trees you know, fend off animals. You're going to be able to use a beater stick in order to split wood up in order to make it uh, a little bit more usable, especially in a human environment like this. It's going to be really hard to start a fire unless you can split that wood up into what we call the heartwood, the inside of the wood where the moisture is not going to be able to get to it. All right, so a lot of people around here, you're trying to make uh, fire with sticks and branches that you just find it off the ground. They've been saturated with all the moisture and the rain and stuff like this. It's going to be hard to make a fire. So you're talking about like batoning wood? And splitting yeah. it. And, yeah. yeah, there you go. Yeah. But as far as real quick, I, I'm, I'm going to send you on a new tangent. Say, I've got they, 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 that, it's like it's like a, you just asked a question. That's a four day course. So, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, before you ask that, yeah, do you have a favorite knife? And you can say just, you can that say, was you my can question. Say, you can say that was my you question. Say, yeah, we don't I, you matter. know, I I I don't I you know what I love trying everything. I've got. A uh, an SE, okay. I got an SE four, five, and six. Yep. I love those. Those yeah. are because they're they are beefy, man. Like, that seems can... to be that seems to be like the gold standard mm -hmm. uh, from mm -hmm. from my experience and the, the mini knives that I've played with. Yeah. Uh, that seems to be everybody's kind of like gold standard. Exactly, you grab. can beat the snot out yeah. of those. Yeah. Yeah. If you had the budget, grab one of each, and, yeah. and they're not even that expensive at all. Yeah. No, honestly, they're really not. However, yeah. on the flip, and much as I I I got off, I you know because it's it's cheap, but Gerber. Yeah. Gerber has this little this this survival fixed blade knife that it's full tang. It's got a little beater on the end of the handle, so it's actually made for striking. So it's not like you're using it, you know, off off label. Um, and then it also has a fire striker in the actual sheath. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the back side of the sheath has a little honing stone too. Yep. Like that thing is so cool. And wow. like I, I bought it thinking I was just gonna snap it right away. And I'm like, you know what? But at least I'll know that it's chintzy and I can tell people not to buy it, dude. 
Like, yeah. we'll have to do a whole I, video on on knife testing yeah. and, and putting them through. Like, I have a whole bunch of knives. Actually, yeah. this was on this was on Ninja a while back that I talked to Eric about doing for the main channel as far as doing a video. Um, and it, it'd be great to have you actually, yeah, actually to, yeah. to, to, to to be a part of it and do it. But I, I went through and I was just buying a whole like I have a whole bunch of different knives. Like any anything from just you know super affordable on Amazon. I ha, I have that Gerber. Yeah, like I have a it's couple good. of those, and uh, I've kind of played around with some of them myself. Uh, but I still have my you know the go to SE knives is what I is in all my you know all my gear as far as ready to go but I'd really like it'd be cool to you know to do some testing yep. on that um and I'd love to be on that because I've seen so many people doing knife testing as I'm looking I'm like you're not really stressing that yeah. knife mm. like, if you were stressing that knife like you were supposed to like I I can see where the fell point would be yeah. mm. I want to say Gerber actually made one of the the army of dot adopted it as one of their like official survival knives but it was yeah. like the lmfk2 or something oh and it was similar to that and it the handle was scalloped so you could actually attach it to like a pole to make like a uh, lash it to a, a, a stick to make a spear mm-hmm. had a built-in sharpener into the uh in the uh sheath yep. had a ferro rod like all of that um it was, it was pretty and that was cool. over a decade ago but yeah we should definitely come together and do yeah. an episode on that yeah. like plan that that'd be fun i'd Heck like yeah, to man. um yeah stress some blades out see if we could break some stuff mm-hmm. yeah. yeah actually and, and do all yeah. the dumb stuff that yeah. people aren't supposed to do but love, they do anyways yeah, i love Romy can stuff. break out of some trunks <laughs> with it <laughs> yeah. Yeah. no we've already said i just push yeah and triangle choke the first dude you see on the outside. <laughs> yeah oh my god so if you had a if you had um that fixed blade is it worth having like a full blade or full tang axe or just like a hatchet and like in a, a vehicle? What would you recommend? I mean, if you I mean, if you it. have this, if you have yeah. the room, yeah. absolutely, yeah, I get a full full on axe in there. Mm. Um, but it, yeah, I usually if I'm just hiking through the woods, I just have a little hatchet because I'm not chopping them big old trees. Like even mm. if I need to make a survival shelter. Like the biggest tree I'm gonna take is maybe you know foster beer can size, nothing nothing too massive. I'm not trying to build a log cabin. Yeah. Um. And if I am gonna do that, then hopefully I'm more prepared than you know. I, I carry the little hatchet because it's if I'm caught off guard, like I'm not mm. going out there to chop yeah. it down, you know. Yeah, I remember um, when I was a um a young kid, I uh survived a plane crash over British Columbia, and I survived <laughs> with nothing but a hatchet. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> There's a book called Hatchet. You did, did you read that as a kid? No, I was reading Boxcar Children. Oh my goodness, yeah. He survives a plane crash and he he had this hatchet as a gift from like his stepfather yeah. or his dad or something like that and he sur- he had to survive all by himself in uh the in British Columbia. Huh. And this is a fiction book or fr- real? Fiction, Non-fiction? Fiction. Oh. Man, that would be cool. I do I'm sure it's you still, can it's like a like it's a it's a young boy, you know, he's like 12 years old and he has to survive. So, nice. so it's still cool. It's, ba- it's based in reality. I'm gonna, yeah. You know what? I'm gonna go. I'm after this. I'm gonna write that down. I'm gonna read that to my boys. Mm. It's a, it's good. I actually use it at a, in my lesson plan for my son. So nice, nice. Yeah, we we'll have to get the book. We we'll have to get the book name. Zane's on a book reading frenzy right now because he's getting paid for every fifty pages. Nice. Zane is not. He has never been like, yeah, I'm gonna read books, and then I'm like, I'll pay you fifty. I'll pay you a dollar for every fifty pages, and he's like, where's the fixed book I can find and make some money, bud? Does the dictionary count? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, he, he pro- Zane probably would. Yeah, yeah, he he literally is crushing Lord of the Rings right now, and I'm like, oh, that's kind of a lot of money. Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's uh, worth it though, man. That is like that is. That's a, a that's a good way to spend your money. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's gonna, man. Be, it's gonna be cheaper than a normal education. It's He's gonna learn cheap. a lot more. My uh, my yeah. son would come the opposite direction. He's like he'd figure out a way to make the dollar to pay me back, so he wouldn't have to. <laughs> 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 that's what he would do uh, like, he, he's well, gonna make about, a lot of money <laughs> yeah like how how about i uh i do this he'd find well he'd find something where he's making two dollars you're right that's what i'm saying yeah the people like that who think that way know how to make money <laughs> yeah yeah dude yeah i remember um one time we had this uh me and my buddies we had this like uh i don't know we were i think it was we were watching like bear grills or something that had just came out and we were like yeah man and we had our BB guns, and I'm like a teenager, maybe a, like a young teen. And like we got into the backyard area, and there's his woods backed up to his backyard. I don't think I've ever told you this story, Roy. And so it actually is my buddies. It's me and my cousins, me and my two cousins. And we were like, man, we're freaking, we can do that bear grill stuff. It's easy. Go out there, and we have our pellet guns. We have our pellet guns, and we see this turtle walk up on this oh log. Gosh. Dude, we blasted this turtle with like 50 pellets. <laughs> and we were like, 
all right, we got to cook them. It tasted <laughs> like terrible, dude. Oh, yeah. Picking yeah. out pellets. It was so gross. Yeah. But uh, Not a whole lot of meat on a turtle. Either. Yeah. <laughs> Eric, I wish you could have seen Roman's face when you mentioned Bear Grylls. <laughs> <laughs> what, are, what are your opinions on it? I, I, you, I, am, I know nothing about the man himself. He yeah. may have been a fantastic operator and a great dude. Yeah. But he is teaching people to kill themselves. Wow. Like, like It's fame. Like I and I can't I can't even watch a show, but I, I've I've seen enough of it. Like when he was, he's squeezing the elephant dung right into his mouth. Oh my god, dude, what was like, that? Why, I don't could, understand the reasoning for that. Same reason he drank piss out of a snake skin. Yeah, same exact one shock factor. You know, yeah. you're gonna get a lot more views because it's cool. Mm-hmm. All right, but that like like you're gonna get moisture in your mouth, but it is going to make you die. Yeah, mm. and, 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 yeah. Who and, would do that? Who would drink urine from a snake skin? I wonder what they look like off camera that. trying to. And, and, and I can't even say it's not even like been out there trying it. <laughs> and it's not even. Like over exaggerating it, because like you won't die if you drink, you know, cow dung and then you go to a hospital and get treated. But if you drink cow dung while you're out surviving, mm-hmm. now you can't keep food down. Yep. You're painting trees with everything you you do try to eat, and you're you're vomiting. And so any water you can get in is coming right back out. You're gonna die of dehydration because you can't keep the moisture in mm-hmm. your body. So it's all this stuff that wouldn't be a big deal, but if you can't get the, the help that you need, the medical attention you need, you're you're in trouble. It, they've showed it on some of those survival shows inadvertently, but they've shown where those and those guys have gotten bouts of diarrhea, oh, yeah. violent mm, diarrhea, yeah. and then they kind of cut the they're, show. They're like, nope, we're not doing it. And it's like, oh, okay. There's, yeah. there's been those behind the scenes that have been released where that where that individual or whoever some of these guys that, you know, do some of this stuff for the, you know, the fame and like the, the shock factor, like yep. you said, it just gets the views up. And the next thing you know, they're they're literally helicoptering them out of there to take them to the hospital because they they have such violent diarrhea that they yep. dude they, I mean, they, they, that what, they are in, that they're dehydrated. One thing I can't say about Bear Grylls, I I am sure that he has a good enough crew and behind the Correct. scenes team that they're like, okay, hey. I know that this is going to give you this, so he take this medicine first, right. mm. and then take this for the next five yeah. days. Yeah, yeah, he's 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 his gut and everything is extremely well prepared, yeah. ready to go for for that shock factor. Exactly. So, Have you yeah. ever watched the show? They're not letting him put himself in danger. Right. Well, and I've also heard, I've heard friends tell me other seer guys that like lived in areas where he filmed, and they like they saw like a rock formation and they saw the vegetation. They're like, I I know where that is. That, mm-hmm. That's a that's a pull off. There's a highway like five feet behind that. Oh yeah, and then I'm like sure. actually gone to that site and be like, see, yeah. look, like here's the road. There, there's there's that rock that has that formation, and like take the shot and be like, yep, that's yeah, where he was. There's uh, a lot of that that that, that footage that you, you can find it on the internet where they where it's been released. It's like they're pulling off the side of the highway. Yeah, for something they're not they're not actually technically being dropped off. Now, have you ever watched the show Alone? I love that's I was I gonna say that, that. that's that a good seemed show. like the yes. most legit yeah. oh, like survival show. Absolutely. And I've one. actually learned more from those shows on some things. Like I will remember this one contestant, this um this female that was on there, and she had like twelve brown recluse bites or something like that all over her body. And Jeez. she she was making her own uh, like homemade pointes yeah, uh, yep. to put on there. And I was like, I'm living my whole life thinking if you get bit by one of those one time, you're dead. You're yeah. going to die. Mm-hmm. And this lady's got like 12 bites, and they actually pulled her off the show, but she was relatively fine. Mm. You know? She wouldn't have been for long. Yeah. Like you, Prob- you're not yeah. going to you're not gonna stop it, but you're not going to die right away. Yeah, you can yeah. definitely treat it pretty well. Well, yeah, again, probably a yeah. week or two, she would have been so sick and, and not been able to recover. She would have had a hole, a hole the size of a grapefruit in the, yeah. where the bite is. Exactly, so, yeah. Uh, I, I witnessed a guy that I used to work with. He was bit, and he, he let it go entirely too long and um next thing you know this entire web as far as like he had a whole like this was completely ate away there was nothing there like it was yep it was gone. And that's another trigger i want to mention since we're talking about spider bites just this is just i hate, hate spider bites in in me spiders. like there's so much for me kind of probably same with you guys and guns and stuff like that it's the stuff that to me is just common knowledge and then when i tell people like oh really um if you get bit by anything take a pen circle it yep. Yep. around the red mark if that red mark goes outside the pen, go to a hospital. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like that's an easy. Like, you don't have to freak out. If you have a bite, yep. that's fine. That's fine. Just circle it. Mm-hmm. Just relax. And then if it goes outside, then go to the hospital. Yep. Same. Same with snake bites. Yep. Yeah. Any type of bite. Yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. like, well, 
I got to be honest. If you get bit by a snake, you probably go to hospital. Well, the, the, mm. the, especially down I mean, here in Florida, like yeah. The key to, I mean, me growing up in a particular area, um, and and like I said, being in the woods constantly all the time, uh, with with tons of poisonous snakes, um, uh, you know, cotton mouse, water moccasins, v- venomous, uh, just ve- yeah, venomous. Sorry, I know, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Stand corrected. I've got, I've got a joke about that, but go ahead. My wife, she she gets she she teaches science and everything else like that, and she every time I say it, she's she starts breaking down and explaining the difference between poison, poison and, and toxic. If it bites you, venomous. <laughs> if you bite it, poisonous. Exactly. So she starts explaining that to me. But venomous snakes. Um, just just learning as far as what those are and, and staying calm enough to actually pay attention to what it is. Uh, you know, modern day with cell phones, at least take a picture of it if you can. So uh, trying, to, trying to figure out what type of snake it is so that mm. it can be properly treated. Well, get, what it, about the critters you have to identify? Do you ever see like, oh, if you lift it up and look under right. its, its yeah. rectum and see oh, this yeah. dot here, it's like I'm not getting that yeah. close. <laughs> that's the same. That's most snakes too. Yeah. Like, well, if you see the band that comes through their eye, that means it's a, no. Mm-mm. Yeah. What, what I tell people is just treat every snake as if it's venomous. Mm-hmm. That doesn't. And I, 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 adults, I tell at least I was like that doesn't mean stay away from it. Just treat it like it's like I don't like getting bit anyways mm-hmm. by anything. No. So I'm going to treat every snake if it's venomous. I'm going to pin down its head, and then if I want to keep it alive, you know, I'll grab it behind its head and then transport it or whatever. Or if I want to kill it, I'll cut it off. Speaking of which. If you want to eat a venomous snake, you pin down its head and then you cut its head off one head length behind its head, mm-hmm. ensuring that you get all of its venom glands out. And then you cut that off and then you can cook it up and eat it. Mm-hmm. The fun thing is the snake's got a reptilian brain. So when you cut it off, the mouth is still going to be trying to yes. bite you. Correct. And then the body is still going to be coming back. That's, I thought that was the coolest thing. The first time I killed, it was a diamondback rattler in the middle mm-hmm. of the desert. Um, I jumped down off of this like little cliff and it was like not happy I was there. So I turned and I was like, ah! Smashed it with my stick, cut its head off, and then uh, while I was holding its body, the the bloody stuff kept coming back and like hitting my arm. That was just the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life. I, I like, just use guns for snakes. I still have yep. the, <laughs> yep. I still have the, uh, the the skin uh, off the first uh, eastern diamondback that I killed and ate. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, still have it. It yeah. actually used to be hanging good, in the shop a, room. Yeah, it's yeah. a good. Oh yeah, yeah that's the one that you had in the shop room. Mm-hmm. Oh, yep, interesting. But so I, me too. Mine, I actually I glued mine with its own like juices mm-hmm. to a cardboard cardboard yeah. box and i just kind of cut it around it because yeah. i was still i was still you know when i when i killed it, i was still in the field for like three more days so mm-hmm. yeah so i i didn't glue mine properly so it uh, the whole, all the edges are rolled up on it so it's all kind of crinkled out so it, it's it's about half the size of what it originally was because i didn't do it sure it was I didn't, I didn't sure it, was. it was this big i yeah. swear <laughs> exactly no i mean it, <laughs> it's, it's a it's a Oh, it's, it's still a good size snake. Size. Like, yeah. it's, it's a good size snake. I mean, it's the length of this table. You know what we nice should do mile. is yeah, it's the length good. of this table. Yeah. We should do is we should go down t- south towards the Everglade area, and do with Roman just learn some stuff. Listen, you were blood. terrified of the sharks, yeah. and you want to go to the Everglades. Yeah. Every- Everglades, I'm fine, dude. In Listen. the water. I, I can run on land. Yeah. I can't run in the water. You can't run oh, in Everg- okay. Everglades, Everglades ever, though? Like, have you tried running in the swamp? You, have you ran in the swamp? I'm saying, I'm not saying let's go sit in a boat in the middle of the swamp. I'm <laughs> saying go let's go find anacondas. where there's some, there's some land and figure stuff out. But yeah. No, I'd cool. be on, on board with that. A- everything yeah, in the Everglades is going to kill you. Yeah. yeah. True. Yeah. yeah. You are the, you are not the Bottom of the food chain. Yeah. 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 Mm. But no, I love doing that. I love just getting out in the woods. That's why it's so much fun just getting out with the boys or, you know, anybody just going out and... Like I half the time I don't know what I'm doing, but while mm. you're out, while it, no, I don't know, I don't know what my goal is. Right. Like, there's no goal; it's just to explore. That's one of my favorite things I tell my boys too. Like you're never lost if you don't care where you're going. Mm. Like I'm not lost; I'm just exploring. You just walk around, and you something will always come up that's really cool, and you be like, "Oh, look at this! Check, yeah. can we do this?" I remember yeah. my dad actually. Uh, we were, uh, I think it was Medard Park. Our park, which is local to us, it's right down the road. Okay. From That's us, where right? we're having the birthday party. Yeah, so it's right down the road from us, where we're from, where our office is here. So my dog park, I remember one of the early on times as being there as a, as a kid, and we it may have been there, I can't remember. But anyway, so we were at this particular park, and like he's like, "Hey, let's let's go for a hike." I'm like, "Okay, you know, go, you know, follow my dad into the woods, go for a hike." And we're walking down this nice and easy trail, and he's like, "He's like, oh, let's go this direction." So we just kind of walk <laughs> off the trail and start going around or whatever. The next thing I know, we're like walking. He's like, "He's like, you'll never know, you know, you'll never know this stuff unless you just go get lost sometimes." So it's like we're just randomly walking through the woods, for, you know, for like three or four hours. Finally, come back, like, uh, just I don't know uh, that. So it was inbred in me early on just to jump out in the woods and just kind of learn it on your own. Yeah, and then and and not be afraid of that and not either. Be afraid. I yeah. remember my my daughter and I when I was we were in New Mexico and I don't I don't remember why, 
But like I parked the car, we just started walking. We just started walking up through these mountains yeah. and these desert and cliffs and stuff like that. And we got like, you know, 20, 30 minutes just hiking through these mountains. And she just started flipping out. She was like, we're lost. We're never going to find our way back. I'm like, what are you, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Do you know who I am? Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you know what I do? Yeah. I was like, we're fine. Yeah. And she and then she was able like she was able to calm down and we picked up a deer skull and like mm -hmm. you know had fun. So yeah. I was like just I was like hey just stay calm. Yeah. Everything's fine. We're fine. Get in the trunk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> With this deer skull. All, and all else fails. Like we walked east from the road. So yeah. if we walk west, even if we're lost, we'll hit a road. Mm -hmm. Stop sometimes and just listen and you'll yeah. you'll hear. I mean there's oh, enough vehicles. Some, around. Yeah. Sorry. So, oh you're good. You'll probably I, just run into somebody who's on their say phone. What you're gonna say, say it. <laughs> so there, was, I, I can't remember when it was, but there was the big storm in uh, in DC mm -hmm. a couple of years ago mm. that like blocked down traffic. When it was it was I seventy five? I don't know. Whatever that main highway is, like yeah. from DC south, and it blocked it all out for like hours. People were out there for you know six, twelve, however many hours. There's a story of a guy who, I guess, just got sick of it, and the t where he lived was just like seven miles. Uh, to the west of that road. So he got out of his car and started walking like he was trying to just walk home through the woods. Didn't have anything, no compass or anything. And it was straight up whiteout conditions. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't see anything. And once he got into the woods, he must have gotten turned around. And because of, I don't know if you guys have ever been in like a really heavy snowstorm, but it, it just mutes everything. Like you can't, the, the snow blocks all sound. You can't hear anything. So he just walked around for hours and eventually just died like 200 meters from the freeway. Oh, wow. So there's cars and people, everybody was like right there, but because of the snow and the trees yeah. and everything, he couldn't hear, couldn't find out where he was going and ended up just dying there. Mm, that's crazy. So all that to say, don't go somewhere unless you have a, a plan. Mm. Like, yeah. Did you? No, when, I want you to walk off into the middle of the woods and just figure it out. <laughs> yeah. I, hey, we just but, said you're not lost yeah, if you're, you're going lost. to explore. Yeah. But, <laughs> but you have a plan, so be, you know, be prepared. You know, mm. know what you're doing. You know, you have your urine, so you're good. Don't yeah. worry about yeah. it. Yeah. Snow Whenever cones. snow cones for days. <laughs> Whenever you were in, like out west, I know. Have you heard of the missing four one one? No. What? I haven't. Oh what my is God. This? All right. So the missing four one one. It happens in hmm. national parks, federal parks. But essentially, it's the code name that is used by the park services for a missing person. Okay. The problem is, is that there's a lot of missing 411 cases that, um, and only mostly, most of the disappearances happen in the West or the Midwest, and they happen almost all the time in federal parks. Where and cave systems, right? There's well, there's cave systems as well, but there's also yeah, actually there is a lot of cave systems and disappearances, and they're connected together. But they will find where it's like they'll be following a set of tracks, like in the snow, and the person's only been missing for an hour, and all of a sudden the tracks are gone, in the middle of nowhere. Huh. So they actually did. Uh, the guy who wrote about it, he used to be a uh, LAPD detective, and he got uh, one of his buddies working at the park service and was pretty much saying like, hey, you should check out these missing persons cases that are happening in like Yosemite and all these national or federal mm -hmm. parks. And, um, you know, they're not doing anything about it because he actually, the park service, they were trying to raise some awareness by these uh, individual park rangers. So he goes and asks, Hey, goes to the federal park service and says like, Hey, I need your missing persons list. And they said, uh, no, we can't give it to you. And he did a freedom of information act. And they said, we don't have it. We don't have a missing person list. And so like, if you look into the missing 411, there's a lot of just crazy mysterious mm. things where it's like people disappearing under missing circumstance, uh, strange circumstances that are never found. Um, so I didn't know if there was any cases out in Washington. I know I have a PJ buddy in Alaska and he's like, dude, we're doing missing persons rescue missions all the time. It's mm. insane. No, I, I, I did one in, uh, in New Mexico. It was a photographer that went out in white sands missile range. Mm. It's not the missile. So the missile range is up to North, but white sands is like the national park. There's just rolling sand dunes. And once you get it, it, it doesn't seem like it's that bad until you get out there and then you're like, oh yeah, you can really get turned around. And the problem is a photographer, like he'd get up on a sand dune and he'd be like, oh, that looks like a cool spot. And then just down and down and be like, mm. oh, look at that over there. And down and down. Mm -hmm. and next thing he knows, like you, you can't, you don't know where you are, or how to get back. And some, somebody called the air traffic control tower, the air force base there and said, Hey, this guy's missing. You know, he's at white sands last. I'm like, okay. So I ended up, you know, grabbing. Luckily, there is a uh, cause there's not helicopters at that base really, but there's a like there's an army unit there that has like a little UH one, little Huey. Mm. So I grabbed my um, my IDMT buddy, and we went over to that army helicopter guy. By like, hey, you guys mind taking us for a ride? They're like what? I'm like and it was just 
it's weird, it's weird how stuff like that happens. Like, we didn't have a plan for that mm-hmm. because that's not really what our mission was. And then he was like, sure. And I hopped up, flew around. This guy was trying to make a smoke signal out of, you know, this brush that just wasn't burning. But, yeah, I'm sure people get lost out there all the time. Mm. And luckily there was – that. that's a huge advocate for if you're going to go and just get lost – Tell somebody where you're going, Mm -hmm. when you're supposed to come back. So that way, if you're not back by then, they can start, you know, activating however they they can come look for you. Yeah. Yeah. That's what's what's crazy and honestly kind of creepy and eerie. Have you heard about it? You've heard about it. Mm -hmm. So missing 411, there is one case. Specifically, this actually happened up in the Northeast. And there was a bunch of hunters. And they had all the old hunters that were going to be sitting stationary literally 50 yards off of the main, like the dirt road that they came into the park on. And then all the young guys were going to go out and drive the deer to the old men. So the old men were just sitting there, right? Just waiting for all the deer to come to them. And they were only 50 yards off the road. And um, they ended up, uh, they're one of the eyewitnesses says that they remembered like around the time that they think, you know, this guy went missing. They're like, it was really weird. Like it was almost like everything was super quiet all of a sudden, like no noise, no animal sounds, no leaves rustling, nothing. Well, anyways, they come back, they're all done hunting, and they find out one of the dudes that's missing is this 89-year-old man, like super old, super frail. He's only 50 yards off the road, and he's gone. There's no gun, there's no clothing, there's nothing. And um, they were only gone, I think it was like only an hour, and they they searched for like 10, 15 miles. They have still never found his body. He's just gone. And so like there's so many of those cases. What one of the one of the phenomena is that usually the person it'll happen what they call it a POS at a point of separation. So wherever the person is now alone, they will go away. All, or they'll, they'll they'll have missing. Also there's an unusual all of a sudden a weather like a bad weather storm will happen right around the time that they go missing. Um, and then they'll find either, uh, they'll have, uh, dogs, so cadaver dogs or dog, uh, you know, tracking dogs and the dogs can't get a scent. Like they can't find where to start. And he said, usually that's very unusual. That's very rare that a dog can't even get a scent. And then, uh, most of the times if they do find evidence of the person, it's usually like farther than is, than is capable for that person to go where they'll find like their clothing, um, there was a guy that hit, he went missing. He was a hunter, and they found his clothes folded in a pile on a stump hmm. 15 miles from where he was last seen, and they still have never found his body. Hmm. It's just really strange stuff. Um, but, yeah. I'm, I'm looking that up. Yeah. Missing 411. Well, that's, first off, it's a little bit alarming as far as, like, immediate red flag when you say that um, – there's a group of hunters that are just sitting on sitting, you know, sitting on this line to hunt. And then there's another group of younger men that go into the woods to flush the deer out. Dude, that's how they do it in Jersey. It's so weird. Really? It was and up they in use, that and area. They yeah. use shotgun slugs. Yeah. And like, I was, so they, I, they use humans yeah. to flush them out. Yep. Yeah. It was, so, and I was, I was joining this hunting club mainly because I wanted to be able to shoot in Jersey. And like, like that's the only way you can find a place to shoot guns mm. in Jersey. And uh, they're like, oh, yeah, we do the deer hunt. And they explain it to me. And be like, oh, yeah, well, you're you're a pro beast. So you'll probably head out there flushing the deer. And I'm like, nope. Yeah. Thank you. Mm, flushing like, I'm not. I'm not going to walk towards you with a gun. Yeah. That's how well, we here do it in, in the South. Jersey. Yeah, we use dogs. We use dogs. Yeah. So we train dogs to do that. Yeah. So There are some dog hunters out there like, oh, I'd rather use a human. <laughs> oh, yeah, they're definitely. I got to be honest. But I can completely I tell rather, you what. I would it. rather use some humans, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, some humans. I yeah. love my dogs. Yeah. yeah. But I can tell you, dogs have been trained to do it. They, they yeah. live for it. I mean, yeah. dogs are bred to, to work. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, they, they, that, they got to have they, a job. That's They got to have a job, and that's what they, you know, and they're probably more more well cared for than the typical dog owner mm. that has that has one sitting in their house. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they just let them sit in the backyard chained up all Correct. the time. That, uh, that dog's extremely well taken care of, not abused. Mm. So they have too much money invested in them. Those dogs are inte- entirely too intelligent, fed well, and trained, trained well. Yeah. They are, they've invested too much time and too much money in the training them. So. Mm-hmm. so what are some, just real quick, uh, I kind of wanted to jump into the scripture portion here quick, but um, what are some, if I was to go buy some stuff to have in my car as a basic kit. Would you recommend buying a survival kit off Amazon or maybe building your own? If, I mean, if you, if you've never done anything before, probably just buy a kit, mm. uh, buy, buy two kits. Mm. So one you keep untouched because usually once you blow those things up, they're not going back together. Yeah. And then, so buy two of them, get one, put it, put it wherever you want to keep it. And then take the other one, take it apart and learn how to use all that mm. stuff. The last mm. thing you want to do is like pull it out and be like, well, what is this thing? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> 
so we in the in the military we have these IRS signals, mm -hmm. all right, and then it's just it's just clips on top of a battery, and then it, it's supposed to be an IRS strobe. Mm -hmm. So you can only in, you know infrared, you can only see it under night vision. And um, I had kid, uh, I say kids, but you know young young air crew members, they were they had it and they clip on like, oh, hey Sergeant Roman, I uh, I need a new battery. I was like, what's wrong? He's like, I, I my light's not working. I was like, mm -hmm. what? He's like, yeah, I'm plugging it on, it's not working. And I was like. Did you have that new LASIK that you can now see, like the infrared spectrum? <laughs> like, what? And I was like, you, you, you can't see it. Yeah. Like, oh, like you just still, I still don't think it actually clicked. He just like, okay. Yeah. No, I'm I'm built, yeah. <laughs> I'm built different. No, I can't see it. I'm yeah. just built different. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, but so definitely, whatever you buy, make sure you know what it is, where it is, how to use it, because mm -hmm. you. There's a lot of stuff out there that you you might look at it and know not know how to use it or not know what it is what it's used for. Read the read the directions, get it out there, and use it. Mm. Especially uh, on Amazon. Yes. The rival kit I bought yeah. only came with a whistle and a pack of lube. Really? What else do you need? <laughs> yeah. What else do you need? Yeah. <laughs> You're probably going in the trunk. When you yeah. said the whistle, I knew it was coming. <laughs> Actually, before you even said the whistle, I knew that, that was going. But in, inside that kit, just, I think that just, was the Bear Grylls survival. <laughs> yeah. Inside that kit, just make sure that you can yeah. collect and purify water, start a fire. And legitimately, that, that's the, the only two. Like, you can get a lot more wazoo than that, but as long as you can do those two things, mm -hmm. you can survive for a really long time. Mm. Um, and then, you know, I, if I, I wouldn't even get as crazy enough to have a plant book or anything like that in there, but, you know. So that's do, you, do you guys ever go over, like, the five, what is it, the five C's? Are you familiar with that? Like, Dave Canterbury's five C's of survival? Probably. You know, there's like so container, many. Like, container, cutting, whatever. I know there's so many idioms there and is, acronyms and all so that many, stuff. There's so many, yeah. And so, yeah, I don't I don't mess with all those. But they have, I mean, yes, and there are so many out there. Just figure out whichever one works best for you and have that. Um, but more than an acronym or the five C's or anything like this, have a working knowledge of mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. You know, I just think through your scenario of what could I come across? What 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 are my basic needs? What do I need to stay alive? Mm -hmm. I need to maintain 98.6 degrees. I have to get food. I have to get water. And I need to protect myself from the environment. And depending on your situation, you need to protect yourself from other things. So have that stuff covered. Well, like you said, the biggest thing is being able to come up with it with the knowledge of like adapting and improvising. I mean, we could probably walk out a hundred yards in either direction and find a container on the ground. Oh yeah. For each one of us, you know, so mm. it's a good thing. People are dirty and they throw all their garbage all over the place and they're fentanyl and they're all that stuff too. And just throw it away. You can use that. <laughs> It'll make our urine taste better. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Well, um, speaking of mountains, <laughs> Hey, that's a good caveat. That's, that's a good, a good caveat. caveat. Uh, of course, it's here. So I always say, "Yeah, no, I've, I've heard." Yeah, right. perfect, perfect. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And everybody's like, no, "That's not the word you want." Yeah. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and caveat over. Um, so I'm reading in Matthew chapter 17, and this is actually a really interesting one because I honestly would like to hear your guys's thoughts on this, as far as what you think, not just pure silence. Every time I read, people are like, "My gosh, what do you think?" And that's all I get. So, um, all right. So here we go. We pre-planned it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then uh, there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered him, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified, as would I. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said, don't be afraid. When they looked, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Then the disciples asked him, why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, to be sure Elijah comes and will restore all things. But if I tell you, Elijah has already come and they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished, in the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. 
Then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. So something that was interesting is, if you look, there's other translations where they talk about the Transfiguration and also in other books, where it is believed that Jesus had the Mount, the Mount of Transfiguration was actually on Mount Hermon. And what's interesting about Mount Hermon is if we know in Genesis 6, that is where the sons of God, or the watchers, came down to meet the Darsmen according to other extra you know, biblical texts and also Jewish traditions. So Mount Hermon is where the sons of God, who created the Nephilim, came to Mount Hermon. And so when Jesus did his transfiguration on that same mountain to proclaim his church, it was literally a spiritual a statement to the spiritual realm. Because we forget that, you know, we talk about this all the time on the podcast, but we forget that because we're human beings and we live in the physical and everything that we have to deal with, we have to touch it, we have to see it, we have to feel it to be able to believe it or understand it, is that when Jesus is doing things, like when he's going up on this mountain to do the transfiguration, the disciples that he brings with him are witness to that. But at the same time, Jesus is also being transfigured and also establishing a church to the heavenly realm. They're seeing it real time, they're seeing it live. And what's interesting is that he comes and he does it on Mount Hermon, and there he establishes his church. And in Jewish tradition, and actually in extra uh, biblical texts, it says that there's people believe, according to ancient traditions, that at the base of Mount Her Hermon was the entrance to hell. So God goes to the entrance to hell and proclaims, on this I will build my church pretty much to proclaiming a victory over Satan and the enemies of darkness, almost a spit in their face of like, I'm going to start my church here, and this is where the transfiguration happened. And now when they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? And he replied, because you have so little faith, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. So I kind of think about my own life when it comes to, you know, my faith, and I think about how often I am so easily pushed over, <laughs> like how easily I am just like ugh, shaking in my boots over simple things that happen in life. Like we, we kind of rag on Peter sometimes in the Bible. He's the only dude besides Jesus to walk on water. You know what I'm saying? And so it, it's one of those things where I kind of want to reflect on myself and and I look at like where how much faith do I have, you know? And and some of that I feel sometimes I have to just ask God for more faith. I just need to ask him to kind of give me that faith because the more I try to think about physically trying to garner up the faith to be able to do things, it's it's like I'm so fallen and I'm so far away from the Lord in terms of being like him that I need his help to have it, you know? But are there some times where you guys struggle, like, just with faith in general, in, in terms of life struggles? I would say, yeah. I mean, often. I mean, it's it's so, it's so abundant as far as, like, you just tend to, and I've used this terminology uh, before, but just, just walking with the blinders on sometimes, mm. like when ignoring the messages that are being sent to you you know, uh, that you, that you, that you hear, you hear that subconscious speaking to you or something like that. And you just, you just kind of ignore it and walk away from it sometimes. Uh, uh, and, and, in those, in those moments in that time, you know, you, you become almost, it's like you do become double-minded every once in a while, like in it, and it takes in our puny and, or at least in my puny human brain, it takes, it takes something take something profound and something large, almost like a smack in the face, like a, like a punch to the gut to, mm. to like, to, to wake me back up and, and realize like, no, oh, like, like that's, you know, this is, that, that's my, God is speaking to me. Jesus is speaking to me. That's my, that's my, that's my direction. That's where I should be going. Quit ignoring it, dummy. Like mm. follow that direction. So I think, I think a lot of us, uh, feel that. And I, I think that, um, we don't realize how often, you know, that, uh, 
you know, the, the devil himself is, is trying to, you know, to knock us down, um, you know, to, to, to let us know or to, to force and force his way into us and, and let us know and say, Hey, that you're, you're, you know, you're less enough that you're not, that you're a failure in this, or like, you know, you're not good enough. Or, um, I think that, that, that happens. I think that happens for a lot of people. And it's just a matter of not, not recognizing it, not realizing it, calling calling it for what it is. Yeah, if that makes sense. Believing in those lies. Yeah, believing in those lies. If yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, That's, it kind of reminds me of. I feel like Jesus is like is kind of has the same when it comes to their faith, the same mindset as we do when it comes to people with firearm safety or with mm-hmm. Roman when it comes to people and like learning a survival skill or having situational awareness. And it's like you don't have any faith. Like, come on, like you know, it just if you had just a little bit. If you mm-hmm. had a little bit of situational awareness, you'd be a really hard target. Mm-hmm. If you had a little bit of faith, you could move a mountain. Well, Jesus called us to believe like children. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, like whenever I had with my kids, when especially as you know they're getting older, and I'm trying to continue to nurture that. But when they were younger, even even now, I would say still, thank thank the Lord. It's just like, hey, is God real? Yeah. Like a matter of fact, not even a question about it. Not even a like, well, I don't see him, I don't this, and asking all these, having these doubts. It was just a, yeah, God's real. Yeah, yeah, he's there, you know? Uh, God will take care of us. Like, I remember times when we were going through a problem, and I remember Zane telling me, he's like, oh, God, I, he's like, I prayed. God will take care of us. He's like, I, he's like, I because I prayed, I know as a matter of fact it will be fine, because God's going to take care of us because I, I told him, I asked him to help. Yeah, he's going to provide. And I think the important thing to point out, especially with kids as well, is... God is going to help you do what God wants you to do. Mm-hmm. So faith of the mustard seed, and you know, I can do all things through he who strengthens me. Mm-hmm. It's, you can't just do anything. Yeah. You can do what God plans for you. Mm-hmm. God has a plan. There is stuff he wants you to do, and you're going to be able to do it with his help. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And what you were saying is, you know, devil saying that we're not good enough. Well, we're not. Yeah. We're not good enough. Yeah. That's why Jesus came. That's, mm-hmm. that's why he's there. So um, having faith, that when you pray to God, you you're not praying for stuff. You're praying for yourself. Mm. Like, give me the strength to see and follow in the path that you've set out for me. Mm. So it's, it's not that I want this and God, please give me this, but God, give me wisdom to mm-hmm. see your path. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's a good point. I think there's a lot of a lot of people today. You know, my, myself included, I was guilty of this in the past of just praying for worldly things, worldly goals, selfish desires, things that are not glorifying Him but bringing me glory. You know, like even the uh, simple thing of like, oh gosh, like yeah, it, you know, it's like help me with my finances, and it's like, well, why do you need help with your finances? Mm-hmm. So you can buy that new car, so you can take that next vacation. And it's like, and, and now, like as we, as I, for me, as I'm getting becoming more mature in my faith and. And understanding that relationship of, we just we start to realize what's important to ask for. Yep. We start to realize what's important to be able to, not, you know, something that is going to exalt my worldly status or possessions, but how I can better serve the Lord, and that I can continue to be a witness to the great things He's going to do in in our lives. And so, it's one of those things where. You know, for me, I've felt like there's been a huge weight that comes off any time that I start to cast those things that are hard onto him and let him take that weight and let him carry that rucksack. And I think that um, something that is really important when it comes to um, our faith is that whenever we are... um, I just had a thought and it just went and went, went right away. I was trying to come up with some filler words to kind of make it come back. Yeah. Um, but yeah, man, I forgot. It was gone. It's gone. Sometimes the path that, uh, Roman, that you're, you know, and that's what I'm kind of talking about as far as the, the whole blinders, that, that path, uh, we, we, we may not want it. We may not, or we may not, we just want to avoid it. Mm. Like, because we're, we're afraid to step down it. We're afraid to walk down it. Um, so, uh, and I think that's where, you know, that, that, that push, it'll continue to come. And it's just like, you know what, this is what I need to do. And you'll, you'll have that feeling you'll have it. And, and, in staying, staying close to the word is, is what's going to, is what's going to get you there. Like, yeah. cause the moment that you start to drip away a little bit, that's when, you know, that's when the devil's obviously going to continue to speak. To you. It's and, no different than people who say they want money. Yeah. Like, didn't work. Yeah. yeah. But it's like, oh, so you don't want money. You just want 
people to give you stuff. Yeah. You want it, you want somebody to give you money. Right. You know, it's not that you you know. I love Job in the Bible, and I use this with Gabe all the time because just like you said, you know, like we're gonna be fine no matter what. Like Job in that whole situation. He was fine. Mm -hmm. Even when it doesn't seem that, he was fine. In the grand scheme of things, like, God, you know, had him in his protection, you know. Um, it may not have been, you know, the... the there's, there's It so may many. not have been that smooth sailing, but he was fine. There's, in the grand scheme of things, he was fine. Yeah, there's so many stories. I mean, you, you take the disciples on the boat in the storm. You know how they you have the little faith. yeah they worried they, they worried, worried. Jesus is riding Jesus is riding shotgun with them you know taking <laughs> <here>. a nap <laughs> taking a nap <laughs> here's your homie <laughs> he's riding with you and uh, and and you're still worried yeah mm. so well, you Roman you had you had a thought there I forgot what it was <laughs> <laughs> as soon as you started talking I can't remember uh, what I was talking about so <laughs> one of the things I I did remember is any time that I have had a struggle where I start to have doubts is usually when I in my personal walk I've been lazy That's with reading was, my yeah. scripture I've been lazy about praying I'm like ah oh, I didn't got time I don't have time for my devotion I'll do it later I'll do it in a little bit Go ahead, send it, it send it. That's what what is where it? it was. All right, yeah. It, so <laughs> it was talking, that. yeah, being in the word yeah. is you know a lot of times people will be praying or or, or looking you know, looking for guidance or whatever. Mm. They're like, well, I don't know if, if what I'm hearing is coming from God or mm. coming from me or coming from Satan. Get in the word. Yep. Mm -hmm. If it's coming from God, it'll be in there. It'll if be it's not in there, then it's not from Him. That's and, right. And test the spirits. Amen. Trust but no. verify. That's mm. it. Yeah. 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 That's that's something where I I think that also God did not put us on the earth when he when he when he made us and he created every single one of us he gave us a mission set and he designed us very specifically for a specific purpose that he has for our lives the key is is that we i feel like i know for me just even growing up in the church it's just like all right well here's your daily bible verse to, or weekly bible verse and uh, pick me up session to get through the work week and it's like god didn't put us on here to survive he put us here to thrive and to do the mission set that he has set out for us. The problem is, is we get in our own way and we want, well, I, I'm, I don't want to do that. Why? Well, I'm nervous about what's going to happen. It's like, no, you have an agenda, which is your agenda and not God's agenda. And whenever mm -hmm. you, God says, follow my way, it's going to be better. You're going to be a lot happier. You're going to have more joy. And also you'll be doing things for the kingdom and you'll be building wealth in heaven because you're honoring me. And it's like, well, well, maybe I can do some of what I want to do in my life and follow my path and maybe some of what you have for me. And it's like, no, nope. you got to do one or the other. That's exactly what Roy was talking about with yeah. putting on the blinders. You yeah. know, people want to see only what they want. They want to see only what they want. They see. have their goals and their agenda to do. Not what God puts before. But not what God has ask, for. Ask yourself this. Why is what you want to do not in line with what I'm asking yep. you to do? Like, that's the mm. problem. The yep. problem isn't you can get yours done and mine. It's why Correct. isn't yes. yours mine? Like, mm. Why is there this separation? Correct. Mm -hmm. What you were saying, um, you don't want to hear the, the dad joke that I made up. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, of course. It. Always. Why, you, you were talking and just, it, it, all right. So why did, uh, how can you tell that God wants us to follow his directions? How? Send it. He sent a manual. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, classic. Right, that was a good That's one. A good it's one. always going to be a good <laughs> one. When you start laughing before yeah, you, you start send send laughing. Laugh. Well, it was during Christmas time, and I was driving. I was listening to it was it was either it was either Caleb or Dre FM. I can't remember where it was, and it was a Christmas song. It was just Emmanuel over and over and over again, and the joke just popped into my head. I'm like, oh, that's horrible. I love it. <laughs> uh, that's a T-shirt right there, that but that's what that is. That is a T-shirt. Yeah. Sorry, I know that was off top. You said no. Emmanuel. No, that's perfect. Like, oh, no, that that's perfect. perfect. Well, um, so I wanted to give you opportunity, but where are some ways that people can find you? Because I have some stuff that I would like to talk to people about regarding you know things that you offer and things that you're doing. But what are some ways that people can find you if they want to see more of your work? All right, so I've got uh, my website is Roman Venture Solution. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a YouTube page, but I don't. I'm, I'm by myself, so I don't have a videographer or anything like sure. that. So I'm starting to work on that a little bit, and I, I'm going to hopefully be working with you guys a little bit yeah. more. So hopefully coming to you guys at Barrel and Hatchet, and then we can start getting hooked up through there. But nice. my webpage is RomanAdventureSolution.com. It has all my contact info for there, and you can, you know, request quotes and ask for classes. Cool. So you so you're offering like survival courses and stuff like that, and right? And so it, it started off. I was doing and, and this kind of right in back to the beginning. It started mm -hmm. off um, that I really wanted to train everybody as a seer specialist. I was doing stuff and I was training people with stuff that I thought everybody should know. But in mm -hmm. the military. There's so few of us, you only got SEER training if you were that high risk of isolation person. Right. 
Um, so I started on my off time. I started volunteering, teaching missionaries, teaching kids, teaching women. I, I taught, I, I organized a women's self-defense class wherever I went, I would try to get into that venue to be able to, and it was just all free, just volunteering. Cause I was like, mm -hmm. people need this stuff. Mm -hmm. I gotta get it out there. Um, and then when I retired, when I, I was retired, when I was up in Jersey. And so I actually started working with the military. There's a lot of military people that needed this training, but didn't have the need. And mm -hmm. so they didn't, the, the military wouldn't give it to them. And so I started running courses for military units up there, teaching them SEER type stuff, um, you know, unclassified, obviously, but getting them the knowledge that they could use, the tools they could use when they went downrange. Mm. Um, and then since I moved to Florida, I moved here about two years ago, so mm. I'm still trying to build my base. But I've been working with, you know, churches that are sending missionaries overseas, um, you know, uh, little, boy, uh, little trail life, the mm. Boy Scout troops, stuff like that. Um, homeschooled groups. Mm. Um, I work with a jujitsu gym and I kind of talk to some of their kids about that, about preparedness. And it's a lot less survival and more like will or uh, urban type, you know, situation where this type of stuff. Yeah. I like doing the survival stuff. That's fun. But what, what people and kids need nowadays is to protect themselves in a real life situation in cities, in urban environments. Mm. Okay. Cool. Yeah, we'll definitely uh, want to have you on for more like content and doing video series on survival and some of the urban uh, situational awareness type things and, and trying to get the word out there. Because I think that's just a really good thing that a lot more people should know, obviously, with things aren't getting much better in the world. So having that uh, outlet. But did you guys have any final words around the table? Send it, Seth. I think, I'm, get, I'm, dad I'm, joke. I'm, dad I'm, joke. I already gave it to you. you. Burned I, gave it you out. I gave you guys gold. <laughs> gold. Uh, uh, as usual, get you, out and train, uh, mm -hmm. and all put as many tools into your toolbox, aka whatever you want to call it. Put it, put as many tools as you possibly can in it. So get out and train. Um, don't just consume and just let it. Roman said it earlier. If you're buying your stuff, buy two, train with one, mm. keep the other, store it up. Uh, we do the same thing with our firearms all the time. Don't you know if you want to collect, collect. But at the end of the day, if you don't know how to use them. It, it, truthfully does not no good to you so and then most importantly at all putting all that first is if you are not familiar with the word mm. uh and you're curious and even if you're not curious i challenge you to just try to gain a little bit more knowledge and then you'll and then go from there yeah i do have something to say so if you are a christian and maybe you have friends or people in your group that are not invite them start a bible study yeah. invite them or even if you have a group of two or three or four dudes get together once a week once a month whatever it is and read your bible together like have that fellowship time and be in the word it makes a huge difference and continue to invite them mm -hmm. be persistent i'm gonna add on that because that's a good point seth if you also have a training group and you like a group of guys that you train with and you are that closet christian be bold you guys are training on things that are preparing people to survive in the physical world, but the most important training that they could possibly receive is training for their eternal one. And so opening up your mouth and being obedient and preaching the gospel to your friends and family members is one of the most loving and caring things that you can do, and it prepares them for the most important thing and the most important mission set, which is finding who Jesus is and accepting him as your their Lord and Savior. So continue to be bold out there. Don't be a closet Christian. If you do not have a Bible and you are curious about what it means to be a Christian and to find out who Jesus is and what he came to do, get a hold of us. We'll send you a Bible. Um, you can send us an email at team at barrelandhatch.com. We'd love to send you a Bible. If you have a prayer request, send it to us in the comments. But Roman, once again, thanks for coming in. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Gentlemen, thanks for the awesome conversation, even the dad jokes. And guys, we'll see you on the next one.